so let's say, uh, Shane, that you go to the house, you do a little investigation, you find out that the district attorney has a real nice house with a very nice, well-kept uh, yard. And you also realize that he, he, both he and his wife are gone during the day and the house is empty. They don't have any servants that are there during the day. And so you go to that house and you park, you know, at, at least close enough to where you can stand in front of the house with your cell phone and you call a landscaping company and you say, hey, I, I really want to surprise my wife. She's out of town for a couple of days. I need for you to come over here if you can come today. And if not, you know, you can also arrange it for another day and just have to show up twice, but that just increases the risk. And so the, the landscaper guy comes out, meets you in front of the district attorney's house. You introduce yourself as the district attorney and tell him this is your house, that you have to leave. But what you'd like for them to do is remove all the sod in from the entire front yard, <laughs> take down the trees, and, uh, you know, and remove all the uh, all the flowers and all the bushes and everything because uh, you're, you're going to want a whole new uh, operation. And um, and you tell the guy that you want this done in one day because you want to surprise your wife when she gets home from work this evening. You want the whole thing done before she gets home from work this evening. All right. Then the landscaping company, you thank them and pay them in advance for the work. And then you leave because you tell them, I've got to get back to court. I'm just over here for a little while. I've got to get back to court. And so they go to work and they rip out all the sod and cut down the guy's trees and tear out all of his, his uh, you know, shrubbery and his flowers and everything and clean the whole place out. And then they leave and uh, the wife and the, <laughs> and the real district attorney come home about the same time and they're like, what happened to our yard? Well, even if there are witnesses, they're going to get a hold of the police are going to get a hold of this landscaping company and they can't prosecute the landscaping company. They didn't do anything illegal. <laughs> and then, you know, that's one time and that's what's that going to cost? Uh, you know, five, seven hundred dollars out of that hundred thousand. Now multiply that out in your brain and think about how many times you can do stuff like that just to that prosecutor. Uh, and you could even go so far as to, you know, uh, Use uh, some some method, just use your imagination and get a note to him and say, every time you don't release this so-and-so, he knows nothing about what we're doing. He has no control about what we're doing. But if you don't release him, we're going to continue doing this kind of stuff to you. And your whole life is going to be like this. Get used to it. I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. But guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because uh, as I've said before, if people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm, so what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get... I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better. But, you know, when, when's it, when's it going to start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism and action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois. Please let me begin by first providing more information on the second realm. If you haven't listened to the first two editions of this mini-series called Building the, Second, or, uh, Building the Second Realm, please make sure to do so before continuing on. Uh, so I've laid out what exactly the Second Realm is, how it differs from the First Realm, uh, i.e. the state of servile society, the importance of privacy and security culture within the Second Realm, and uh, probably a little more I'm forgetting too. Today I want to tell you about how individuals living in the Second Realm, I'll call them Venuans for the sake of expediency, and plus that would be what they are regardless of whether they uh, are aware of the term at all, uh, how they interact with uh, the First Realm. Uh, whether for economic benefits or otherwise. 
Uh, this was a, a term Rayo coined called import-export, or the one-directional isolationism between the servile society and uh, an individual's Vanu home basis. To make import-export concrete, Rayo would exp export his Vanu, uh, or libertarian publications, to the servile society as a source of income and would import goods, uh, say historical food, and uh, knowledge back to the Siski region where he practiced wilderness Vanu. Rayo also exported his labor at certain points during the year. That said, the authors of the Second Realm book on strategy elaborate a potential, uh, potential way to implement uh, import-export. Quote, another area unique to our situation is the integration into the larger economy. Since a sufficient market size and diversity can only be hoped for in the long run, we are required to interact and integrate with other markets unless we want to find ourselves in a subsistence economy. However, this integration comes with great risk. These facts call for a special career that is especially interesting to people uh, that have not yet found their vocation or who have left their previous vocation and are looking for low capital opportunities. The proxy merchants. A proxy merchant is a bridge connecting the second realm to the first realm while keeping risks at bay. Many ways of bridge building are conceivable from people who handle exchanges between second realm money and official currencies to shopping and trading agents, end quote. And they are correct. As I said in the last episode with Reagan Keeley, early on, import-export would be necessary. The goal would obviously be to stay outside of the first realm completely, but uh, we are not there yet. As Kyle Reardon uh, in, uh, said in his book report on the subject, quote, Fundamentally, these proxy merchants are professional intermediaries between the realms. Much like the Venuan concept of import-export with the servile society, proxy merchants enable an interface with the first realm so as to facilitate commerce. I would further suggest that said proxy merchants be those individuals who don't have a criminal record or, or any sort of questionable behaviors, according to the cultural dictates of the first realm, that would invite police surveillance. Uh, end quote. The proxy merchant idea is interesting. Obviously, some Venuans will choose to operate businesses in the first realm and may need private property, in quotes, to do so. Though it's not wise to attach your legal name to a piece of property as it makes you an easy target of the coercers. The job of the proxy merchant would be to operate in the first realm almost exclusively, if not completely, and would likely be big into real estate and investing. As Kyle said in his, uh, his record, or hers preferably, uh, would be squeaky clean and he would follow all applicable laws and regulations so as to not attract attention. The proxy merchant would likely be sympathetic to those in the second realm, or may just see an opportunity to profit. Either way, Venuans must, they must, uh, trust this individual not to snitch to the bludgies. Uh, regardless, backup plans should be in place if the proxy merchant gets turned uh, in an interrogation uh, or an investigation. This can even be more large scale. For example, industrial business parks, uh, some of them are so large that it's super easy to hide an underground apartment complex uh, exclusively for new ones, a secret workshop, think Breaking Bad, uh, or a slew of other things. I mean, just be creative. The authors of the Second Realm book on strategy continue, quote, Many lead a double life with only an occasional visit to our markets where they are greeted with their pseudonyms. Others operate their business, business half a day in the first realm in open shop in the second realm after sunset. Still others are true ghosts in the first realm, having no footprint there except for traveling through it from one autonomous zone to another. Some of them having perfected their livelihoods in our world, but others that just cannot stand the shallowness of the other side anymore, end quote. That is the role of the proxy merchant, uh, or, or in other words, the import-export between the first and the second realms, and uh, should provide you with an idea of how such interaction could be facilitated. In conclusion, it's worth noting that the authors are correct. Import-export is an extremely dangerous task considering the coercion and outright violence of the First Realm. Strategies such as the Gray Man and security culture more generally must be exercised when, you know, I guess in both realms, right? All that said, uh, oh, I guess all that out of the way, I'd like to welcome Jason Booth and Ben Stone to Liberty Under Attack Radio. Uh, ben, Jason, it's, uh, it's uh, great to have you. Uh, how are things going, guys? Good. Good to be here. Oh, I am so stoked to be helping you on LUA and talking to Ben. I, I, it's beyond words right now. <laughs> that's uh, that's certainly certainly great to hear. So before we even you know get into I guess the subject matter, uh, I know uh, you you two have talked quite a bit uh, you know via Twitter, but I know this is the first time you have audibly conversed. So uh, I know there's some things you guys like to talk to talk about. So uh, go for it. Yeah, I wanna I wanna start by telling Jason, telling everybody how much work Jason does uh, in in you know trying to get a better society and and pushing these ideas ahead. In addition to other things that he does, he also runs the Bad Quaker, or at least he's he's one of the main people, uh, probably the he the heaviest poster on the Bad Quaker Facebook page. In addition to uh, posting a ton of stuff on Twitter f about the uh, about my books, Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage, Field Manual Number One. So, Jason, you know, 
uh, I couldn't be more appreciative of all the work that you've done. Oh, and that doesn't even mention uh, the steam at work, too. Uh, well, now I mentioned it. But anyway, Jason, it, I really appreciate the work that you've done on that and, and getting the word out to people. Uh, truly, Ben, it, it is my honor, uh, and I am grateful that you allowed me to help. Uh, Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage, just like just like with, with Vanu, man, it was it was one of those things that just I read it and it and it clicked, like it just made sense, and I I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to like help promote it, and I wanted to get this out there because like I want to be free. I'm tired of being I'm tired of being a slave in the survival society. I want to be as free as I can be, and and both your book and Vanu are are ways to facilitate my uh, ability to be free and to help others be free and to um, my children to be free. I mean, that's that's the ultimate goal. I should also uh, publicly say again, um, thanks to Shane and, and Liberty Under uh, Attack for um, doing the audio version of the book and uh, making it out available to the public. That was, uh, I just imagine it had to have been a gargantuan task dealing with that many different uh, personalities and getting the thing divided up and recorded. It's just, that's just a, a stunning work. I really appreciate it. And we get a ton of downloads off of that too. Right on, right on. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the downloads here in a moment. But uh, but honestly, Ben, it, it was kind of surprising. Uh, you know, they, they say, you know, hurting anarchists is like hurting cats. But uh, uh, that was actually, I was surprised at how smooth that entire thing went. Um, so I, I think that's just a testament to your book that people said, hey, um, this needs to get done. We're going to do it. So, um, you know, obviously, thank you to all the people who helped me, you know, limit uh, limit the amount of work that I had to do, uh, you know, narrating. Uh, and Ben, yeah, it's obviously obviously no problem. I'm glad it's uh, getting a bunch of downloads. And speaking of downloads, uh, I recently saw on Twitter, I think it was Twitter, that uh, you've gotten a lot of downloads from Ethiopia, uh, which is, uh, I think it was Ethiopia. A little, little strange, a yeah. little strange, but I guess, uh, do you have any idea why that is? Is there anything happening in Ethiopia right now that we're unaware of? I guess it's a pretty nasty government that's over there, but then someone uh, offered a, uh, maybe a more plausible explanation that uh, that someone's using a proxy that's bouncing off of um, uh, IP addresses in in Ethiopia as a as a disguise, so to speak. But um, if so, excuse me, if so, it's uh, it's using a lot of different IP addresses. And um, and most of this took place over a 24-hour period. There was I can't remember what the final count was, but I'm thinking it was uh, I don't know a couple thousand uh, one night, uh, all from I Ethiopia. The download. I don't think so. Um, and it was downloading the PDF version, um, which you know uh, I guess a lot of people in Ethiopia speak English, so that would kind of make sense, but. I, I also, if somebody else was running a proxy for a large group of other people, I, or or the other thing that someone said is uh, uh, it might be something to do with the uh, uh, torrent downloads. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not that technical to know. All I know is I saw this huge spike from this one country in this one night, and it was like, holy cow, what is happening with this? Right, right. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure, yeah, those those all seem to be plausible. But, but one thing that does not seem plausible is one individual doing all of this. I mean, how many copies right. of a digital PDF do you need? Right. <laughs> right. So yeah, I, I, I had this, interesting. I had a similar thing happen to a a, um, a, po a podcast I did with the old Bad Quaker podcast. This was in early 2012, and I had done a series of predictions about the 2012 election, and specifically Ron Paul. And then it was a couple months later, and I, I should say, and Ron Paul's son, and uh, and how some kind of gift would be uh, arranged. I won't be too, um, I won't accuse too much. But anyway, I had made that prediction on the podcast, and then some months later or some weeks later or something, I can't remember now, I came on and did a, a podcast. I, call, I called it, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. And in it, um, I basically said that. I said, I told you this was going to happen. Now the, the fix is in. Ron Paul will not even be speaking at the at the thing. And, you know, his son's embedded in the Senate. And there's not going to be any, you know, there won't be any kind of uh, um, uh, 
any kind of ruckus made over this. It will just be swept under the rug like it never even happened. And that podcast, I think it was about a week after I made that podcast, caught on in the Beijing area of China. And we got over 20,000 downloads uh, from uh, I don't know how many IP addresses because it just filled the, the, you know, the list of them. Um, all from Beijing area in one day, like 20,000 in one day. And then, it, and you can look, uh, at the bottom of the, um, of the page, it tells you where the hits are coming from, if they're coming from Google, if they're coming direct hits or, right. and they were, and they were listed as coming from email. So it appeared as though there was an email that had gone viral in Beijing and it evidently contained a link to, uh, to my podcast and they all downloaded that that uh, um, Ron Paul commentary that I made. Interesting. Interesting. They would care about American politics. Um, but I guess, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised. It's probably demonstrative of some of the stuff happening there, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine. But uh, that's, uh, that's certainly, uh, certainly interesting. Uh, and I don't know, maybe, maybe we have an ally in these, in these uh, countries with, you know, pretty big podcasts. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know, they, they, maybe they found, uh, you know, uh, your book after, you know, a couple of few years of it being out and said, oh my gosh, I need to, I need to talk to my listeners about this. So maybe we have an ally in Ethiopia. I don't know. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll probably never know unless they, they reach out to you directly. Yeah. Right. So, so I guess one other, I guess, preliminary point here. Uh, so last time I had you on, it was, uh, I guess the, the purpose of it was, uh, to discuss, uh, freedom bed and breakfast. And um, obviously, we discussed your book too. But uh, I, 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 what's what's going on with Freedom Bed and Breakfast now? I, I think I saw that it was on kind of a hiatus. Uh, could you could you kind of uh, fill the listeners in on kind of an update of what's going on there? Yeah, um, there was a uh, an internal struggle. Let's put it that way. I'll try to be as polite as possible and non uh, accusatory as possible. But there was an internal struggle. Um, I and all the rest of the team, except two people. And, and there was, I don't know, I'd, I'd have to think it through, but I think there was five or six people on the team at the time. And we all were under the impression that the programming was being written and was almost done. And we would have a, a you know, a, a beta version of it available within days or a week at the most. And then it came suddenly in one day to all of our attention that not one line of code had been written. Mm. That... Uh, and we were, you know, I was promoting it in every way I could, expecting a rollout within a week or so. And so um, there was some really quick, somewhat harsh business decisions that were taken on my part. And I basically uh, kicked everybody out of the room <laughs> and, um, and locked everything down, changed all the passwords on everything, and just put it under wraps. And then I slowly got a hold of one programmer that I have a real high level of trust for. Um, and, uh, but he said he couldn't start on it until after the first of the year in 2018. And I said, that's fine. I am not in a hurry. I'd rather have it done correctly than, uh, you know, than not. So the plan at that point was to restart the thing in January of 2018, but there's a product right now called a uh, cell 411 that already it's had some modifications this year in 2017 and already it does almost everything I envisioned. They're just not marketing it that way. So I think what we'll do is probably in 2000, uh, in uh, January, 2018, we'll probably bring the site down, kill it completely, um, throw away all the names and everything. And, uh, uh, just refer anybody who uh, has helped us out or and is interested or whatever over to Cell 411 and uh, explain that their product seems to be able to do everything we had envisioned. So, and that'll be fine with me. I just wanted somebody filling the gap, you know, um, sure. and there wasn't anybody. There was nobody that was doing that kind of a thing in a, um, in an anonymous way. And, uh, you know, um, uh, what Air, Airbnb is uh, uh, they they would have been the big competitors, but you know they are so in bed with the government that it's just disgusting. Right, right, and yeah, I'm familiar with Cell Phone One One, and I'm actually I think Virgil Vadiva is the one that developed that, and uh, he uh, he's in a couple of uh, cryptocurrency groups that I'm in, and uh, 
I don't know. I, I honestly haven't. Uh, I, I downloaded Cell Phone One a couple years ago, and I, or I guess probably a year ago when I had a different phone. I haven't re-downloaded it. Um, but I guess I guess the question for you, if you're if or I guess kind of the I guess maybe just something I need to find out is, uh, you know, how is the security? You know, uh, are the servers you know in the United States? Uh, do they have anything on have any information on the servers that could be, um, I guess, uh, that the U.S. government could get a hold of? Um, do they, you know, allow cryptocurrencies, you know, or I, I guess, I, I don't know, I guess those are kind of the, for the things that you talked about that you're trying to, I guess, differentiate, I guess, Freedom Bet and Beckfrist from Airbnb. Those, that's what I'm interested in, the privacy, the cryptocurrencies, um, that sort of thing. So I guess I'm just kind of interested to see, uh, I guess I need to download it and actually see what they offer, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, Virgil seems like a good dude, so I, I, and very into Monero, so uh, that's, I mean, so, so privacy is important. So I imagine that's, that's how the app is developed, but I, I, again, I don't, I don't know for sure. Yeah, I kind of expected that I would get a hold of Virgil in some way in the next few weeks and see if I can get a dialogue going before I officially, you know, kill my project. Just uh, um, make sure that I do have a good understanding of his of his product and and uh, make sure that that he is. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure from what I've read that he's on board with a lot of uh, what I'm thinking. But um, but I would kind of like to talk to him and make sure uh, before I officially kill my project and endorse his. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. I think that's the uh, that's the uh, you know the, the the smart move, the smart move. So, Jason, you got anything, man? Uh no, I, I'm just sitting back and listening, and uh, uh, it's it's a shame. I like I was I was really into the idea of Freedom BNB, but if Cell Four One One has this option on it, then um, I'm all for it. I'm all for it because this this is a product. This is this is a service that is very much needed. Right, right, and uh, and I can't think of how many times Kyle and I, whether on Vaughn or LUA, have uh, you know given out. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of a lot of niches that need filled. You know, market services, and uh, you know we give a lot of ideas away for free. You know, that could be very profitable businesses, but we just don't have time or the knowledge to to, to do so. Um, so as long as there's someone filling that market demand. Uh, then I don't give a damn who is the one that does it, uh, as long as you know the the ideology is uh, you know relatively close, and as long as you know privacy and and uh, you know I guess free market anarchism are kind of uh, you know kind of a, a part of uh, a part of uh, the the program, the the uh, the end, the end product, so to speak. So um, so yeah, as long as people are feeling the demand, I, I certainly understand. Uh, I guess you, your approach, Ben, uh, seems pretty similar to mine. I, was, I don't I don't care if I'm the one that does it; it just needs to get done. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay, good deal, good deal. So, so I guess twenty minutes in, let's go ahead and get uh, and get rolling. So, as per the title of this mini series, the goal of this episode is uh, the goal of this episode is to strategize on ways to build the second realm. To do so tonight, I plan on connecting some things we've talked about in this podcast, uh, such as avenging angels, assassination politics, and anarchist vigilantes, with things uh, you know you Ben discuss uh, in your book. So, namely, the last two sections: simple sabotage and ethics-based selective regular warfare. Uh, so if you haven't caught our two-episode series on those subjects, please check out LUA Podcast number 57 and 58. And if you didn't catch my first discussion with Ben, uh, which will, will relate in some ways to, to, to tonight's discussion, uh, please check out LUA Podcast number 29 uh, from all the way back uh, in April. So the question to answer is this. Can killing bludgies in the pursuit of true justice influence individuals to join the second realm, and can it help further the development of the second realm? With that said, it would behoove me to provide a disclaimer. This episode will be in line with the Supreme Court decision, Brandenburg v. Ohio, 395 U.S. 444, uh, in the year 1969. There will be no incitements or specific targeting, and therefore it is covered under free speech. Now, guys, I know uh, it's not you to think the state will follow its own laws and proceedings, but I figure, you know, might as well, you know, cover our ass while we're having this conversation, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It, it can't hurt. Right, nothing negative is going to come from it. So, and I, I can't, I'm trying to think of how many times... I think I've used that disclaimer about seven or eight times in this podcast. So, um, yeah, this is a. I mean, the listeners shouldn't be. Uh, it shouldn't be. <laughs> it shouldn't be a new a new topic of discussion to to, to the uh, listeners of Liberty Under Attack. So, I guess. Uh, um, so so Ben, I guess some introductory questions. Um, you know, as far as uh, um, you know, as far as your book, and and I guess for for those who may not be aware of you, I guess somehow. Um, why don't you tell the listeners a little about yourself, and uh, uh, and we'll start there. Okay, um, so 1978, I began in this uh, in the realm of uh, of hating the state and looking for ways to fight against it and do anything I could, and 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 very selfishly, that was when 
I first encountered the state in a horribly negative way as a teenager and having to deal with uh, police on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I just decided that, and not only that, but I, 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 my, in my mind, I instantly connected the police with the city hall that I was, you know, the town that I lived in and their relationship to key businesses in that town that essentially created a monopoly to keep other businesses out of the town. And I, and it, I just saw it in that tiny little uh, uh, version of the state. I just saw that this is exactly what we're dealing with everywhere in the world. We have this crony relationship between, you know, the enforcers and the authority and the, um, the, uh, oh, what do you, and the enablers. And, uh, and I kind of declared war on them. And my method at the time was very limited. I would do radical, stupid things like, um, uh, you know, if you urinate on a pavement on a street in Southern California where it only rains about six inches a year, um, if you urinate letters and you can add to it each night, you can spell out a pretty good sentence that's going to stay for like six months, which <laughs> I would do things like that right in front of the police station. <laughs> Um, which I don't recommend, but um, but I did little things, irritating things like that. I would go to the city's uh, the city's maintenance yard at night and take like half a dozen guys with me, and we would all carry two five gallon cans, uh, you know, gas cans each and a hose each, and we would just go and make a collection, and the city <laughs> would donate to us, and you know, and then we would all have uh, either for us or our friends or whoever needed uh, supplied, and we would do that. And I can say that now because the, you know, it's, it would be impossible to prosecute such a thing after so many years. But that kind of, that kind of thing um, led me to the point of where uh, I was starting by about 1980. Uh, I was starting to look at uh, a black market ways of financing a straight out war against all government. And, um, and then some things turned bad and good for me, uh, turned bad in the black market realm, but turned really good for me in the sense that I met my wife, fell in love. Um, we decided, I decided to back off a little and, you know, have a family and not make my life's work, uh, fighting the state. So I took some time off. <laughs> I took, uh, about 20 years off and I, uh, raised a family and I guess about 25 years off. And, uh, during that time, I just kind of, I mostly kept my head down. I tried working with the Republican party in the eighties and that was just, it was just a nightmare. And by 1988, I figured out that politics was really a scam, especially the Republican party, uh, was incredibly corrupt and the convention meant nothing. It was all just a show for the cameras. And I left there in, in disgust uh, before the actual, before that evening when everybody was supposed to go on the convention floor, I just left. I was sick of it. Um, I embraced the Ron Paul campaign the, like the next day. I joined as a libertarian and, and started doing everything I could for Ron Paul in 1988. And then I realized that the libertarians, the libertarian party, um, the only difference between them and Republicans is that the Republicans were a lot more numerous and had been doing it longer and therefore were better at being corrupt. True. Yeah. Yeah. So I just stepped completely out of it from 1988 until I guess about 2003, um, I found myself, uh, uh, unemployed due to injuries. So, uh, technically disabled, but, um, but I could still do a lot of stuff. So with the internet in my hands and with uh, the ability to make fake identification, you know, fake uh, uh, um, names on the internet, I stayed anonymous doing uh, everything I could do without directly confronting the state um, for as long as I could. And then I eventually in 2011 started my podcast, the Bad Quaker podcast under my real name. And um, this is where we are today wrote the book, uh, Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage, Field Manual Number 1. I wrote most of it. Some of it was written in 2015. No, I'm getting years mixed up. Almost all of it was written in 2015. We finally got it published in 2016. And um, so there it is. And I can take 
uh, 100% credit for the entire, the, the book's in three sections. I can take 100% credit for the first section. The second, sesh, second section was largely me taking the book um, field manual number one from the old uh, uh, OSS, which was the parent organization of the CIA. I took their field manual number one and kind of just updated it, changed the wording a little bit, and then added a few modern twists to it. So that's section two. And then section three is a sort of a, an amalgamation of a bunch of conversations that I had with, um, among other people, Bill Bupert and uh, a, a friend of his that uh, they allowed me in on a three-way um, email conversation that was very technical, uh, talking about military uh, tactics and advantages and things like this. And then a bunch of campfire meetings with some really hardcore, some of them were right-wing militia types and some of them were biker gangs and uh, hard, hard, scary biker guys and, you know, farmers, regular, everyday guys who were farming, but also some of the things they were farming were uh, uh, forbidden plants. And uh, I took a lot of notes from those uh, conversations and uh, sort of put them all together for the third part of the field manual. So I can only take, uh, I can only take credit for the third part as far as I put it together and, uh, you know, if there's grammar errors or whatever, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Did I, did I answer that? Yes, you did. Or yes, did you I did. just ramble? Yeah, no, you you, de you definitely answered it. Uh, and, you know, there are a couple things in there that I uh, obviously kind of the start to the story. I had heard this, but heard, hadn't heard that before. But uh, uh, certainly, uh, certainly an interesting uh, path to, to where you uh, how you got here today. So um, so speaking of your book, uh, you know, tell us generally, you know, generally about it. Uh, you know, uh, and also kind of, uh, I guess, I guess a general overview of the book. And uh, I guess, what were your goals when writing it? So were you trying to convince people to go out and do these things? Uh, um, I mean, could you speak to that? Sure. Um, in the beginning, there's a disclaimer that says, uh, and I hate it when people do this, you know, somebody, somebody will come along and they'll make some kind of a horrible racist joke and you look at them and they're like, oh, I was kidding. I was kidding. And you just kind of like, yeah, right. You were. And I, I really dislike when people do that, you know. Um, so in the first pages of my book, I'm scrolling down to it now. It has the authoritarian disclaimer. And it says this manual should always be referred to as a fiction, as a poor attempt at humor, as political satire, and as a, par as a parody of the 1944 OSS publication, Simple Sabotage Field Manual, not to be taken seriously. So, um, so I'm just joking. It's just a joke. I just, you know, I'm, so, I'm a clown. I'm having fun. So uh, in it, I'm pointing out um, some things that other people have pointed out about how delicate that not only governments, but the state actually in a bigger sense, this, this uh, multi-headed thing that, that – uh, Compri is comprised of the authoritarians, the order givers, the order takers, and the enablers that, that you know, the giant corporate mega corporations and the banking cartels that, that make sure that these people in, in authority keep their authority and keep the brainwashing flowing and keeping, you know, those monsters that all work together to keep oppression in place. Um, it's really a pretty delicate balance. And it's based on several really thin myths and a pile of lies and a very small number of people proportionately threatening violence to a very vast ocean of people that could easily just wash that authority and, and violence away anytime we, we choose. One of the things I try to think of when I'm, when I'm thinking of these things, there's a scene in Fight Club where... Um, a bunch of people who are playing the role of waiters um, at, a, at a big event just snatch this guy, drag him into the bathroom, pin him against the floor, and they explain to him that they do everything for him in his life, and they can stop anytime they want. And, and that's kind of the thought here, and I say that in the book and is in a little bit more wordy, but we, us out here, guys and women and, and people who are, you know, dumping the trash and 
and fixing roofs and working on air conditioners, we keep all of this stuff running and we don't have to completely shut everything down. <laughs> but if we, if we just, just make it cost a little bit more, just make it take a little bit more effort. We just tire those uh, a little bit, just that the ones that are, that are keeping this whole mechanism rolling if we just make their life a little bit more difficult, if if there's enough of us doing that, pretty soon the whole thing it's it's it starts to wobble. If you ever see, they used to in back years ago. You don't see it so often nowadays, but on TV they would have these um, um, acts where the guy has poles that he would balance with a plate on top, and he would spin the plate on top of the pole and he would get two or three of them going then five or six of them going and he'd get a whole bunch of them on the stage of these poles that are standing up balanced with a plate on the end and he's spinning them and spinning them and uh and, it's, and the state is very much like that it's like there's all these plates being balanced on all these poles and all we have to do is just tap a couple of them and they all start like dominoes just falling into each other and then we're going to really see what a buffoon this guy is standing on stage with all of his plates broken, his poles laying on the ground. And it takes such little amount. And that's the purpose of the second part of the book is to get a person. It's not to, you know, to be overly specific and say this is we do A, B and C. It gives some examples. But mostly what it wants to do is get the mind going in a in a um, uh, in, in a pattern that will let you see uh, exactly what can be done uh, and how little of an effort that it would take um, just to, I'm scrolling again, that's why I moved away from my mic slightly. <laughs> um, anyway, sabotage is a, is a kind of thing, it can be done in huge, you know, big explosions and towers falling down and all that, but we don't need any of that stuff. We just need to make the cost of government and not just the cost dollar wise, but the emotional cost and, you know, the day to day cost that individuals have to put out to keep the government going and keep the, the, the this whole network in that is the state. If we can just do a few little things and make their life worse, um, then then that's the kind of sabotage that can make a huge difference without risking anybody getting caught or getting hurt. Uh, without damaging any uh, innocent people or their property, um, just little things, and and that that mentality is what I wanted to to get rolling in people's minds that are suited for that kind of thing. And again, in the first part, I say that if you separate everything uh, in the in the anarcho world into what's above ground and what's below ground, the above ground people should never be involved in any of this kind of stuff, none of it whatsoever. They should be peaceful. They should do podcasts. They should write articles. They should help each other. They should talk to people. They should do all the stuff that's above ground that is peaceful and legal and keep their lives as clean and straight as possible so that they don't get harassed and so that the state doesn't end up taking their money for silly things like fines and stuff like that. But the underground people, um, you know, they need to absolutely make sure that they don't pop up on anybody's radar, that nobody realizes what they're doing. Security they don't drive culture, around. Yeah. yeah. And, and this kind of relates what we're going to talk about in a minute with, uh, with Vanu uh, uh, as well, because these people have to be in a position of complete secrecy in what they're doing. Uh, and then part three, uh, you know, gets into um, the hard part of this that's going to only be suited to a very small group of people that can do things that other people either, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but it takes a lot of nerve to, uh, to take the kind of actions that are going to need to, that are going to need to be taken. And it takes a kind of a person who can almost set aside their emotions and um, make a judgment on something and hopefully there you know, won't just be one person out there on their own, but, it, but sometimes it will be. And, and they can make the decision and then they can follow through by doing something that's really hard for the average person to do, but it brings justice to a situation and it ends 
um, bad stuff from happening. Is, is that too vague? No, I, I know I know exactly what uh, you're uh, talking uh, about. And sorry, Jay, one second, Jason, I'll turn it over to you. Um, but when we get into the uh, assassination politics portion, and even kind of the Avenging Angels thing too, obviously the pursuit of justice is, um, you know, or obviously goals for those things. But uh, but you want to talk about, you know, um, uh, you know, the eth uh, ethical based selective regular warfare or the ethics based selective regular warfare, um, you know. I mean, you know, talk, look at warfare today. I mean, uh, political assassinations, uh, those very much kind of fall inside and fall within that realm. So, uh, so yeah, we're we're gonna go um, maybe not a little more in depth. We're going to definitely return to uh, um, to these subjects. But uh, but Jason, go ahead, man. Sorry to cut you off. Oh no, I was just gonna say that um, uh, to to use a line from the Servile Society, the lesser of two evils, right? I mean, this is this is this that's basically what irregular warfare is. It's it's Acts performed that are of a lesser evil than the acts that would be performed if the original act wasn't performed in the first place, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, so that that was definitely a good overview. I, I think it uh, definitely does uh, does the book uh, justice. Um, but uh, but but I I really want to since uh, the last two sections of your book will be uh, I guess the most heavily involved here we're gonna we're gonna connect uh, you know your book to uh, to to I guess helping build the second realm so um, can you go I guess a, a little more in depth on uh, section two simple sabotage and section three ethics based uh, irregular warfare I mean uh, um, what is proposed in the book um, you know can you kind of walk through how how they could kind of be implemented uh. Um, what strategies are discussed and, and kind of what what is the overall purpose of of uh, sections two and three? Sure. So again, the disclaimer that um, as it explains in the first section that the above ground and the and the and the underground have to be separated it, it, very much like uh, in Ireland for I don't know a couple hundred years, there was the Irish Republican Army, which were violent. Um, deadly uh, terrorists. They were um, they were an army. They killed people. They actually they killed uh, civilians as well. They were not they were not nice people. And there was the above ground, which was Sinn Fein. They were the political arm. Now, I'm not suggesting we use that as a pattern because first off, Sinn Fein tried to use uh, the state to improve the state, which is just illogical to me. It just seems nutty. <laughs> um, and and the uh, and their violent arm, the IRA, um, they weren't selective. They would pretty much set off a bomb on a bus, and and if it killed a soldier and three civilians, then hey, the civilians are just part of the. I mean, they had the same attitude as the state has when it comes to killing the innocent. So I'm not I'm not getting behind the IRA and Sinn Fein, but I'm saying that kind of separation where. Um, you couldn't go arrest the members of Sinn Féin because they had no connection to the IRA. Well, yeah, they did. They had all the same goals. Yeah, but you couldn't find a connection where one was talking to the other or where one was financing the other. And if you can't put that connection together, then legally you can't prosecute them. Well, that's what we need between our above ground and our underground. We need that absolute firewall that nobody can pick up an above ground and prosecute him or her um, for financing the underground, um, there's an absolute separation between the two. And even the above ground, whenever possible, need to denounce. It, first off, deny there even is an underground. The underground needs to be secret enough that it can't be proven that it's real. And then the above ground can just say, oh, yeah, that's crazy conspiracy theory stuff. What are you people? You looking for Bigfoot too? Is that what, you know? Well, now once we get to the underground, the underground is then divided into two groups. The first group being those taking care of sedition and subversion um, and sabotage in a, um, in a very covert way, uh, very quietly, as much individually as possible, um, but not really doing, but not taking justice into their own hands. All these people are doing is maybe if, if they're skilled at hacking, maybe they're collecting information and then feeding that to the justice end of this, but they're not, they're not taking the actions themselves uh, as far as justice. But what they are doing, if they can do little things in their job, like um, some of the strategies are if you work in a government job, uh, you don't necessarily quit it, 
you keep getting the money from it. It's good money. It's, you know, it's easy work. It's not like you're really breaking your back if you work for government mostly. So keep doing the work, but just do it in a way that even though it'll appear to your boss specifically that you're doing a good job, figure out a way to muck things up, to slow things down, to put, to plant weeds in the garden, to, you know, to pour molasses into the, into the gears or just whatever you can do that will just make things run slower. Or, you know, what I know a person, I know I've said it often enough in the public. Okay. So I used to be a contractor for NASA and um, this was in the nineties prior to Napster's existence, but it was right in that time frame. I think they were probably working on a Napster beta version about that time. And I had access to a, uh, to NASA's, um, to their main network. So I would go into computers through the network. I would go into computers in different NASA locations and pile MP3s in there and uh, load a program that had a back door in it so that anybody that knew that back door could get in there and access those MP3s. Oh my gosh. So, so I was essentially running a, a file sharing, pro a file sharing protocol on NASA computers um, before uh, Napster even had music on the internet. That's so badass. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's badass. <laughs> now, that was because I, I, it was all about IP to me. I was um, trying to subvert IP laws in doing that. It wasn't anything against NASA. It was trying to um, trying to overcome this this crazy idea that you can prevent people from sharing MP3 files of music. I wanted to make so much music available for free in so many different locations that there was no way they could uh, uh, implement the the IP laws. So that's and I did that. Uh, obviously, I'm st I never got arrested for it, so I got away with it. And now here we are, you know, 20 years later, and I'm bragging about it in, in the open. So, you know, uh, I don't know, something could probably still be done about it, but legally I'm talking about. But um, I, I think they'd have to find them first. And <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> but that, you know, that was my method of subverting the IP laws. But but let your mind go in different directions. I gave an example in the in the book about um, uh, tricking the media. Y keep in mind this is before Trump started talking about fake news and all that kind of thing. Well, I had said in the book that we need to feed the news media's we, we the the mainstream media we need to feed them fake news. Send it, figure out what their biases are, and then give them ridiculous stories that meet their bias. And they will they will follow through and, and tell those stories. And then we then the above ground can go back and laugh at them and point at them and say, look at this. They're posting. This is fake news. And I gave a couple of examples. One would be um, uh, a few years back. There was a thing called the Carlos hoax. And I would encourage anybody to uh, search that out on Wikipedia, the Carlos hoax. And this was a wonderful thing that uh, a group did in Australia where they took a fake psychic and they hyped him to the media and uh, and they and they totally tricked the media and the and they got all this free publicity from the media, but there was no psychic. The whole thing was fake. Um, and of course, the media looks foolish afterwards. Well, if you do this enough times and you discredit the media enough times, you don't win over everybody, but you subvert the trust people have in the media. And recently, you know, we had this thing with the um, uh, the AR-15 uh, add-ons. Right, where, right, yeah. Uh, C CNN, I believe it was, pictured a, a chainsaw as an attachment to an AR-15. And I, I don't know how that got in uh, to CNN. I have no idea. I don't know whose mistake that was. But that's exactly what I'm talking about. Get that kind of public mistakes that are so obvious that they utterly discredit an organization and all the organization can do is then juggle around the truth, trying to figure out a way to come out of it looking good. Um, now, in the third part of the book, uh, which is, uh, I think you said the, the title of it a second ago, which is Ethics-Based Selective Irregular Warfare. Um, this is, uh, you know, talking to Bill Bupert and then reading a bunch of history about places that have fought government where... Um, the uh, the indigent population was extremely 
undersupplied, underfinanced, undermanned, and the government uh, usually was a, a foreign government, but it doesn't always have to be. It can be, um, you know, native government as well. But uh, the government involved was high tech, um, high budget, lot of boots on the ground, and still the government lost. And you can look at different situations, whether we're talking about Southeast Asia with Vietnam, you can look at what happened in Afghanistan a dozen times and is happening now. You can look in North Africa. Um, I believe I use Algeria as an example in the book where you have a very small group of dedicated people who are willing to, um, to bow their head and act like uh, they don't mind the government being there at all. They don't mind those soldiers. They don't mind the French being there until they, you know, until this French soldier turns his back and then they take very fast action and there's a dead French soldier. Um, and in Algeria, it was a very small group of fighters that were responsible for completely humiliating the French army. And this was right, this is not long after World War II. And the French were, um, I know there's a lot of jokes about the French army and stuff, but those, that's, that's kind of uh, unfair American making fun of the French. The, the, uh, the hard French fighting units, especially, you know, the French foreign legion was, has been legendary for a long time. And that's exactly who these guys in Algeria were, were fighting. And, um, and they were the French foreign, the French fighters were, were vicious and well-trained and heavily supplied and a very, very small group of dedicated um, fighters were able to just hit and run, hit and run, never, never provide a battlefield. You, you make, you make your strike and then you get completely out of there and then you just fold yourself right into the seas of humanity and you'd look like everybody else. And there's nobody to strike back. If you imagine a boxer fighting, a, fighting an, indivi an invisible boxer, this is what we're thinking of. The, 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 the invisible boxer can punch the other boxer and then move to a completely different part of the ring and, and the regular boxer wouldn't be able to know where to strike next. And that's how irregular warfare uh, is done when you, when you are a small, weak group that can't afford uh, casualties and you're fighting a large, slow, dumb government. And uh, it's just, it's really not that complicated. And then when you add into it um, individual justice and vigilante justice is the way I talk about it in the book. And I use the example that the, the media, uh, as far as like the Hollywood movies and that kind of thing, television, they have for 100 years now, they have gone to great lengths to demonize the idea of vigilanteism. And uh, uh, Shane, on your show, I've I've heard uh, comparisons to uh, superheroes and the, you know, like Marvel comics and stuff like that. And it's right, exactly right, yeah. The Just same to thing. step in for for yeah, Kyle. Yeah, I was pretty silent for that first episode. Kyle, Kyle, I'm not I'm not big into comic books or anything, but yeah, he he went uh, you know real hard into that. So yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> And, and if anybody hasn't heard that, they should go back and listen to it because that was a real eye-opener. It, ma it made me realize, because he pointed out that right after World War II, all these veterans coming home, um, they started taking on vigilante justice for themselves because they saw that the government just wasn't doing it. So they were um, you know, killing mafia hitmen and uh, getting the, the mafia guys that go around making their collections in the big cities. Um, you know, extorting local businesses, they just grab those guys and beat the socks off of them, you know? Right. And, and, and I wasn't really aware of that until he mentioned it. And then I said, I got to go look this up and find out what, you know, what was going on. And sure enough, uh, it only took a few years and, you know, the media and modern culture and pressure from friends and neighbors and family, and they shut all that stuff down uh, and it stopped. But right after World War II, those guys coming back from the mili from being you know forced into military service during World War II, they were already accustomed to um, to the kind of hard things you have to do uh, in order to bring real justice. And uh, you know we, we've got a lot of vets right now that are being that are coming back from overseas, and their eyes have been open, and they're like, 
you know, this we were not doing what they say we were doing when we were in Afghanistan. We were guarding poppy fields. We were, you know, blowing up villages where there was no there were no terrorists in that village. And some of these people are really their eyes are opening and they could be a tremendous asset to us if they understand these precepts. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, with, with without a doubt, without a doubt, and and Ben, I just want to I want to compliment you here. I you know I ask a, you know I I need I need to stop doing this with most guests I think, but uh, asking a bunch of questions. But uh, I mean you were just you know on point. Answer, you answered all of them, and you you went further than that. So I want to compliment you on your on on your uh, uh, on your on your ability to do that. I, I still struggle with that, but uh, but yeah, I mean you went right into to, to the to the I guess the first subject we're going going to discuss. So anarchist vigilantes. Uh, my obviously my first question was to kind of go into well I guess that there's still there's still one aspect that you you didn't go into a, a whole lot um, regarding vigilantism and that was uh, in, in your book Sedition, Subversion, and Sabotage. Uh, again, guys, go uh, you know read it or listen to it. Uh, LibertyUnderAttack.com forward slash Benstone audiobook. Um, you talk about something called committees of vigilance. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about uh, you know what those are? Sure. Um, and and these were really popular in the 1800s in areas of the old west um, before uh, government authority had had a chance to come in and you know uh, and take over and monopolize uh, uh, um, justice. So uh, this was a real common thing in uh, mining camps and you know in the prairie and places like that where um, the local men in the area who were uh, respected and um, were suited for such behavior, uh, when, when there was somebody that was causing trouble, they would get together and say, well, what are the accusations? What evidence do we have? Um, talk to any witnesses that they needed to and come to a conclusion. What are we going to do about this? And then they would go themselves and, uh, and fix the situation if that meant grabbing a guy uh, and dragging him out of his house and giving him a thumping and uh, telling him don't ever do that again or we'll be back and we'll and this will be far worse they would do that sometimes sometimes they would just uh, it would just be a warning they would go to him they would grab you know physically take control of him so that he they had his undivided attention and explain to them exactly what they were going to do the next time that he did this horrible thing that he had done or in other cases they would have their own little trial, either with him present or without, and they would go in and have an execution. Now, this is uh, people are aghast by this nowadays because they see it through the eyes of uh, that Hollywood has has given them, and and they think, oh, this is terrible. But how is that any more terrible than if you call the police? You've got you know some problem in your house. Let's say a um, a man and a woman are having a problem with with each other, and and the woman who calls the police on the man and the cops show up and there's a misunderstanding and they shoot the man. Well, I don't know. Maybe he deserved that. Maybe he didn't. Or, or worse, they show – maybe not worse. Yeah, worse. They show up and they separate the man and the woman and then they talk everything down and then they leave. And then the man goes back to beating the woman again and it happens. It goes through the same cycle. They never solved the problem. And in right. worst case, and it happens regularly, the, you know, one kills the other. Because they had relied on the police to separate them and fix this problem, and the police completely failed. And the whole time, all of us are paying the extortion taxes that that keep this system going. And the you know, of course, the prosecutor is paid out of the same bucket of money that the judge is paid by, and the police are paid by, and the the um, um, the defense attorney, if you have to go with a public defender. All that comes out of the same bucket of tax money that they stole from us for this system. And then if they convict the guy and they throw him in jail, then who's going to pay for all that? Yeah, us. Exactly. We pay every bit of it. And then we. And then what are we going to do there? Whoa. Well, we have a uh, um, a private uh, prison company that is <laughs> charging, not only charging all the, all the tax money that it can eat, but it's also charging the prisoners, many of which – are only in jail because they because they were in possession of a plant and then they get charged the whole time they're in jail and come out in debt to uh, to this prison company through you know one of the major credit cards on my dad visa or whoever and uh, and one of the major banks and the whole time 
they are still the criminal. They, if they did something bad before, they're still going to be doing something bad, except they'll have, you know, they'll be more criminalized by being in a horrible place like that. So, so the government doesn't provide us justice now. The government system is not broken. It's, it was misdesigned to begin with. So true, uh, true um, uh, committees of vigilance, <clears throat> excuse me, would, uh, would form anywhere from two to maybe 15 or 20 people, according to the size of the area and, and you know, how much activity needed to be done. But looking at it, I, th I think the most successful ones stayed under five members. Uh, there was one in San Francisco. There was a committee of vigilance in San Francisco that had uh, several hundred members. And once they got to a certain size, they were, there was so much arguing done in their meetings that they really couldn't get anything done. Um, so they they kind of um, they kind of overgrew themselves and became as useless as the city and the city the official uh, uh, you know city government was there at the time they were just helpless and the cops were all corrupt so um, the committee is, of vigilance had to form to take care of you know keeping the streets uh, safe because the police were were so corrupt that they weren't you know weren't even trying um, but. These committees of vigilance pretty much sprang up all over the Old West, and they, for a hundred years, they maintained, uh, you know, justice in many areas long before there was ever a local sheriff, like we see in movies. That that almost never existed until way up into the late 1800s. Um, most there was some federal marshals that were in some of the larger towns, but um, most true sheriffs uh, type situations didn't start happening. In, in a lot of the Old West until almost 1900. And all of that time, if you look at the actual statistics, there was very little crime compared to even what there is now. Um, there was a guy in uh, University of Dayton that did a study about um, bank robberies in the 1800s. And he found out in spite of all the glamour of you know the different famous bank robbers from the 1800s, in spite of all the, the uh, publicity about that kind of thing, excuse me, um, bank robbing per capita is far higher now than it was in the Old West. There was very little bank robbery in the Old West. And the reason why is because back then it was before we had fractional reserve banking and your actual money was in that bank. And when you went down there and you made a withdrawal, they withdrawed your actual money out of your account and gave it to you. It was not just some you know numbers on a computer that's shoved into the Federal Reserve System. Right. So the locals were the ones that made sure that the money in the bank was safe. And that was done with a committee of vigilance. And in cases like um, Coffeyville, where um, the um, the Dalton gang, attempted to rob two banks in Dal in uh, Coffeyville and it was the citizens that took them down it was it's not like it's shown in in many movies today um, it's not the sheriff going out there you know Matt Dillon or whatever and he's all uh, I realized that kind of aged flagged my age there but, um, I knew, I knew who you were talking about <laughs> but it could be I any you know local <laughs> it could be any local uh, local sheriff or local whatever and he's the one that's going to go out there and stop it. And no, in most of those little towns, they didn't even have a guy like that. That's a that is entirely a Hollywood myth. Most of those little those little tiny towns didn't have a local sheriff or a local police or a local jail or any of those things. The committee of vigilance took care of it, and they did it very you know very cleanly and very accurately. And if they were overly harsh, the community would deal with them. They had to answer directly to the community especially when they went home to their wife or went to the church or went to the grocery store, not to, they didn't have grocery stores, but if they went to the local, um, you know, feed store or whatever, they were right there among the people and anybody else could just form a committee of vigilance and take them out if they weren't doing their job correctly. So it was a very, it was a very good system. And I actually steal some of the names of it when I, uh, give, um, uh, uh, when I in the in in the beginning of the book, I I mentioned uh, the Orange Free Regulators. Well, that that's that was a real group of that was a vigilante group. That was a committee of vigilantes. The Orange Free Regulators, the elders of the Bald Knobbers, were an actual uh, group of uh, a committee of vigilance. And I might add that the that the descendants of the of the elders of the Bald Knobbers 
are alive and well, and I've talked to them. That's why I felt comfortable awesome. using their name. So there, there, there are committees of vigilance in existence. Now, with the bald knobbers, they're very careful about what they do, and they are very focused on making sure that they protect uh, the local farmers in uh, southwestern Missouri. That's where the bald knobs are. Um, they, uh, they protect the farmers in southwestern Missouri um, from people who would turn in these farmers for farming, for raising the wrong um, crops. Uh, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. I, I, I don't know how much more <laughs> obvious I can put that. Right. But let's, let's put it this way. If I lived in southern Missouri and I saw a particular type of plants growing on somebody's farm in large quantity, the last thing I would want to do is make a phone call to any government agency to question them about these plants because the bald knobbers don't play around. Uh, they are very serious in what they do. So, right, right. Uh, very good, very that good. Was, so, that I, was a lot of yapping. Did I get around to it? <laughs> yes, no, yeah, it was a very, very good explanation. And, and you were mentioning kind of, uh, I guess, uh, early so called uh, so called America. Um, I do want to point the listeners in the direction of uh, I actually did a, a it's hard to call it an audiobook. It was a I, I'll just call it a spoken discourse. A spoken discourse of an ac academic white paper by uh, a previous libertarian candidate, uh, Roger Roots. It's called Our Cops Constitutional, and that is, you know, obviously pretty status. But what I will say is, uh, it's a it's a very very good white paper for for uh, for for anyone looking at like the history of policing in in, in, in this country, uh, because it's very much like uh, like how you described Ben. Uh, and then uh, and in a lot of places, it was just I mean the the uh, the citizens had a duty to apprehend criminals. There was no police force if if they didn't capture them, they would, uh, you know, they would get away and there wouldn't be justice. So, uh, so yeah, certainly, uh, you know, vigilantism is, uh, I would, I would, I would argue that it's, it's, it's very much a staple, um, of this, uh, of this so-called geographical area. Um, so, so Jason, uh, so Jason, I'll, I'll turn it over. Do you have anything uh, you want to bring up right now? Uh, I just, I just wanted to read a quote from Ben's book real quick. Um, he says, uh, uh, vigilante justice is the single most dangerous thing the state faces. To start with, the state claims a monopoly on justice, but vigilante justice is the only way to achieve true justice. The alternative to just to all, the alternative to vigilante justice is the perverted version of justice that the state supplies, and we know what kind of distorted justice that is, and what kind of sick and twisted society it produces. All right, so we're, we're talking about anarchist vigilantes now, and uh, as uh, as Ben said, this was a two-part series, and as I said in the beginning, um, that I do recommend you guys check out. Just go to uh, the show notes for this episode. Um, so I'll kind of do, for, for the next subject we're going to talk about, I'll give kind of a brief overview of the proposal and uh, what I think or how I think it could be used uh, to help build the second realm. So the first one, yeah, anarchist vigilantes. So um, I guess kind of the definition is anarchists taking the law into their own hands to administer, you know, true justice. Um, so the idea here is the general perception of anarchism, uh, you know, on government-controlled media is the black bloc folks that bash, you know, Starbucks windows. If anarchist vigilantes could do the bludgies job better than they can and take rapists, murderers, and, you know, other psychopaths off the streets, uh, it would be hard for the government-controlled media to ignore, right? I mean, it'd be a huge story. Uh, and in turn, you know, I, I do think it could make the viewers think, uh, you know, hmm, maybe I've uh, been told the truth. Maybe I haven't been told the truth about anarchism. You know, I've, I've, I'm told they're just kind of these lawless, you know, it's lawlessness, chaos and all of that. But, you know, they're, they're kind of doing these things, uh, you know, that the, that the cops are supposed to do. Huh. This is kind of strange. So that's kind of the first part of it. Now, now getting back to, I guess, specific anarchists, you know, implementing this strategy, um, now, obviously, uh, this would take some highly specialized training, and in, uh, I think it was the second episode uh, of that series, or actually, no, it was probably the first episode. It would take highly specialized training. You're dealing with violent people. Um, now, I, I will point to you know the threat, man threat management center as kind of a, as kind of an example. They do some very highly specialized training, but it would be far beyond that if you're actually going to you know, I, I, I guess to, to put it one way, I mean, if you're going to be going going and stopping murderers you know by yourself, uh, that's different than doing it with a team and without knowing kind of the, the psychological talking down things. So um, highly specialized training, and uh, it would not be wise to start trying to gain justice from bludgies or government agents. I mean, 
uh, that'd be uh, that'd be pretty pretty tough to do, I would say. So um, you got to build up. You know, start with local violent drunkards, the the victim being mugged in the alley, etc. Then work up to hardcore hardcore criminals, organized crime, etc. And uh, after the vigilantes have a you know sort of a system worked out, uh, maybe a committee of vigilance, and are competent enough in their trade. Then, you know, possibly it could work its way up to the bludgies uh, and other state agents. And these would be the folks for the next thing we're going to talk about, assassination, assassination politics, that actually go out and kill the bastards. Uh, you know, uh, John Smith, uh, you know, one of this, this really terrible guy whose policies have, you know, murdered millions. Uh, you know, these, these so-called anarchist vigilantes would be the ones delivering the justice. They would be the, uh, the, the accurate predictors in the assassination politics system. So, so my proposal, guys, I'm, I'm really curious on your thoughts, is that anarchist vigilantes could help to rid individuals of their controlled schizophrenia uh, and statism and serve as, I guess, advertising for, for the second realm. So uh, off the top, what do you guys think? Uh, Jason, I'll start with you, man. Uh, I love the idea. Uh, start small build, and then build up. you got to have a strong foundation before you try to tackle the big things. Uh, and as for helping rid individuals of controlled schizophrenia, uh, the, the anarchist vigilantes would be a huge thing that the above ground anarchists, the above ground activists could point to and say, look, look what they're doing. Look at the good that they're doing. Look how they're defending the community. Oh, where are the police? The police aren't doing this. The police are shooting dogs. Look what the anarchists are doing. They just saved an old lady. I, I, I love this idea. Right. Yeah, right. me too. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Ben. Oh, I was just going to agree. Um, <clears throat> Jason linked to a story in um, Louisiana where there was a, a young lady that had been horribly abused by her stepfather for years and years, tried to get help, uh, couldn't get any help. Her mother was no help. Her mother eventually left and left her with the abuser, and this went on for years. And eventually, I, if I recall the story correctly, she was about 15 and, and had a boyfriend, and the guy, the abuser – was arrested and went through, you know, and, and uh, uh, pled guilty and ended up with basically just a slap on the wrist and yeah, a few I, years probation. Yeah, that's what, I think I think it was I think it was he ended up with uh, um, aggravated aggravated sexual assault or something like that. No, no jail time, uh, like a four year probation, something like that. And this had been really? a very young girl to begin with. Go, oh, go yeah. Uh, um like 11, I think it was 11 to 15 is uh, yeah. the, the time, the, the period of time when she was with him. And he ended up only being in, in any kind of uh, jail or anything for 18 days, if I, if I recall. And the rest was probation, probation um, for this horrible uh, abuse and torture of this poor girl. And uh, so she and her boyfriend decided to take justice into their own hands. And... Um, uh, and he went over there with the intent of just beating the guy up and teaching him a lesson. And I guess he got a little out of hand and uh, he ended up killing the guy. And now, so they face just crazy jail times for killing this horrible monster. <clears throat> now, right. if if there were other choices, there we go. If there were other choices that this poor girl could have, uh, somebody she could have reached out to other than, you know, her mom or the police or, you know, the, the current so-called justice system. If there was some something on, let's just say on the Internet that she could kick, click a couple things, put in her story, a skilled person could check out the story, see if it's true. Mm -hmm. And then the, the right people could just go over there and safely do this without um, is maybe the same result as, as what happened with the guy getting killed. But they could do it in such a way that they do it safely. They don't risk um, uh, over, you know, the, the, the kid that actually killed the guy did so, like I said, because he got out of control. He, he, he lost control of the situation. Well, a professional might not have done that. Maybe. Yeah. Someone, maybe someone separate should've. from the situation without all of that emotional, you know, that, that kind right. of emotional frustration. Yeah, exactly. I agree. But maybe the guy should be dead anyway, because anybody that would do that to an 11 year old girl, maybe you shouldn't be in our society anyway. Of you know, course, yeah, I'm not yeah. saying. I'm not saying that the state has the right to kill anyone. I'm I'm against the death penalty when it comes to state, uh, you know, with the government uh, doing that because the government is not in a in. I I don't think the government has the right to kill anyone. Um, on the other hand, you know, if if uh, if a committee of vigilance carefully looks this over and the girl 
who is the who is the victim in this says, I want him dead, then I think that justice would be served if he's dead. Yes, um, of course. It, it comes down to restitution. It's not like, uh, oh, this this guy stole $1,000 from me. I want my $1,000 back plus interest um, or, right. you know, emotional damage to pay for to pay for, I don't know, my broken arm, my medical bills, whatever. This is. <clears throat> this is something. Uh, this is something a little different, right? Um, when it comes to to rape, I mean, that's going to cause a very, very likely a uh, lifelong emotional damage from that. How do you put a dollar amount on that? How, how do you put a? Uh, you, you, it, it comes down to a case to ca a case by case by case basis. So yeah, I mean, if the if the girl says the only way that you know I can you know move on with my life is to know that this guy is dead and that he can never do this to me again, um, I think it comes down to you know the victim, what they what they think. Um, you know, would would be restitution. So yeah, I I certainly agree with you. And yeah. I know if if there was a committee like this that was available to the public, I'm sure that current police organizations would try to bait them into something with uh, some type of a, uh, you know, um, a, uh, <laughs> where they try to get them to do something that they can arrest them for. Sure. Oh, abs absolutely. They couldn't. They. The police have a monopoly on force, and and to have anyone challenge that monopoly, challenge that 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 protect and serve uh, uh, mentality that they have, they they would have to absolutely they would have to try to set them up. Um, but the, to to go back to the story real quick, uh, to to go back to the the, the old west uh, that you brought up earlier. Um, in, in, in the the modern old West stories there's a uh, the, the the bad guy that runs the town right he, he's a, he's a dictator he hurts people he steals from people the town hires a gunfighter to come in and challenge him to a duel right that's that's the kind of thing that we're talking about with these uh, these anarchist vigilante groups mm -hmm. they, they, they could be the the hired gunfighter they could be the one that comes into town and and takes out the bad guy gets the justice for the town or the person or or the community um and and just makes the world a better place without the whole appeal to authority without the coerciveness without the 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 faux justice that is is the 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 federal department of justice Right, right, you know, and and one one more thing, real quick, and, and Kyle and I talked about this in, in uh, that in, in one of those episodes, and uh, I, I think it would also be demonstrative and, and also very, I guess, mind changing, uh, you know, to to individuals in the state of survival society, because say there was a, a committee of vigilance that you know they've they've been around for like 10, 15 years, they are the best, you know, they're better than the bludgies, they're a lot better than a lot of special ops guys, they know their shit, they've been doing it for a long time. Um, like, so let's say they go after, you know, some criminal, you know, uh, organized criminal syndicate and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever they're doing, whether it's, uh, you know, um, murder, rape, whatever it is. And let's say the committee of vigilance starts taking these guys out. <clears throat> it would not surprise me in the least bit if the, the government bludgies spent more time trying to find the vigilantes and actually going out, going after the actual criminals. I think yeah. that alone, um, if the, the folks in the state of survival society could kind of see that. Uh, and there were folks in the above, you know, the the above ground, uh, as as you as you put it in your book, um, to point these things out. I think that would be very mind changing. It's uh, so we 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 hire we supposedly you know pay pay for these guys to protect and serve us, and they're going after the people, you know, going after the people that are actually doing, you know, the bad things. Huh? Something's right. a little off here. But yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I was just agreeing. Yeah, you know, yeah. I I do want to throw this in. I've bashed Hollywood quite a bit. There are a couple of uh, examples in the opposite direction that fit very much what Jason was just talking about. Like um, the original Magnificent Seven was exactly that. And it was taken almost line for line from the great Japanese movie, uh, The Seven Samurai. And a comedy version of that same thing is uh, The Three Amigos. Um, all three of these are basically <laughs> the same, you know, the same movie. <laughs> God, I love that movie. <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, the but the concept is the same. Even if the bad guy is the state, or if the bad guy is just some local thug, you know, and you go and you hire the best, and they come in, and they can't do it all on their own. You know, sometimes they do, but uh, but it takes a community support, and they teach the community how to police itself in each of those uh, in each of those examples, but. Uh -huh. 
it, it can only be done by experts who really know their business, or in the case of Three Amigos, uh, at least they know how to put on a show. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess um, to I guess to, to kind of wrap up wrap up this a little bit, or, or I, I guess um, try to answer the questions that I put forth at, at the beginning of the episode. Um, so with with anarchist vigilantes, I think with our with our discussion so far, uh, I think they could certainly be you know great in assisting in building the second realm, um, whether it's advertising, whether it's just um, kind of a change in mindset, even the status of all society. Uh, that uh, okay, the the bludgies don't actually provide real justice. So uh, even if it's just going to a private you know private business or some uh, I guess black market, uh, um, some black market uh, black marketeer or marketeers. Um, I think it could be highly valuable uh, in, in helping to, to to build the second realm. Yeah, definitely. Oh, with, without a doubt. All right, very, very, uh, very, very good. Uh, so anything else there? Can we move on to uh, assassination politics? I'm for it. Yep, That's really what go. I wanted to talk about anyway. <laughs> right on, right on. Okay, this, this, this will be fun. I've, I've talked about this like three times on this podcast so far, but it's my – absolute favorite it's one of my favorite um discussions discussions to have so um so a short definition if you want to learn if you want a more in-depth uh you know discussion on this go listen to that two-part series i'll link in the uh in the link in the show notes or just go to uh, libertyunderattack.com forward slash assassination politics uh where uh, you know we do a podcast episode on it and you can find uh, jim bell's original articles uh you know mirrored there on the uh, on the lua page so uh so kind of the definition and the proposal so the idea which was not originally conceived of uh but developed upon by jim bell uh, in a series of articles in the mid 1990s, uh, that's that's where where this originates from. The idea is to set up an online gambling website using digital currencies and, and, and encryption, uh, wherein individuals would attempt to predict the death of various individuals. So, say John Smith is just the biggest piece of shit in the world. His role in the state and the policies he endorses have murdered countless millions. Uh, and uh, count, needless to say, individuals. Uh, would like to see this this uh, piece of garbage six feet under. So uh, they could offer, say, one Bitcoin and uh, a prediction as to when uh, when that will happen, when justice will be served. So let's say you know thousands of other individuals from all over the world would do the same thing, and uh, the hitman allegedly would predict the correct time and death, uh, correct the time of death, and receive the winnings. So what's interesting, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this, but uh, actually in 2012 or 2013, a Tor website following this model was set up. And, uh, you know, Forbes reported on it. Uh, ben Bernanke had the highest number, uh, which I don't remember what it was, like five or ten million dollars in Bitcoin uh, or something along those lines. Um, obviously, nothing really came of it, but it was, to my knowledge, the first such attempt. So so as far as assassination politics, you want to talk about, you know, real justice, uh, kind of the committees of vigilance. Um, these guys that, uh, you know, will go out and... Uh, you know, do these things, or the folks, uh, um, the folks in uh, in your book, Ben, the Section Three, the uh, the guys that would be willing to do the uh, ethics-based uh, selective irregular warfare. Um, these would be that guys, and there would be a financial incentive. You know, the market provides, and uh, you know, the market provides justice too, guys, um, for the socialists that may be listening. So I, I guess for, for currently uh, adapting this to the second realm, um, obviously blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies are. They are the honestly, they are the biggest thing um, that can help with 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 the second realm, kind of the the baseline infrastructure, and even a lot better than uh, what the state of survival society has today with uh, uh, with the very highly centralized internet. So, for assassination, assassination politics specifically, I've talked about this before, uh, but the Monero blockchain would be fantastic for this and would make it a hell of a time on the state to apprehend uh, anyone. So, Khan, kind of I talked about some, no, actually, no, not some some downsides, but. We talked about it, and he made it clear that you know it would be almost impossible for the state to to uh, to get the hitman or to you know uh, for them to actually do anything to the to the predictors. I mean, it would be very very difficult, and uh, this would be a major major problem for the state, uh, and especially when their uh, their own guys are starting to get gunned down or however they uh, are taken six feet under. Um, so so the proposal is that. This administration of true justice could also serve as an advertisement for the second realm. True justice is being applied, and uh, you know, even with status, right? Even with these uh, these these clo these uh, controlled schizophrenics out there in the state of all society, uh, all over the world, um, there are folks. Uh, if you talk to talk to if you you know, I guess maybe pull some people in the Middle East, you know, who they think is the worst the worst uh, one of the worst people in the world is probably one of the presidents that you know has killed their entire family or something, right? Um, so this would not be limited to the United States. I think there could be a great pool of money and a uh, great financial incentive for for true justice to you know um, 
to to, to be uh, to be sought. So, uh, what do you guys think? I'll, I'll turn it over to you, and I think this will be a very interesting discussion. But uh, sorry, with you last time, Jason. Let's uh, let's start with you this time, Ben. So yeah, another name for these is to call is Deadpool. Um, they've kind of been theorized about for a while in different ways. But um, one of the things I was thinking about this was, you know, I I believe the one that you were referring to back in 2012 gave uh, like down to the minute or something, or maybe even the second of when the uh, of when the person died uh, that you could bet down to that to that point. I could be mistaken on that, but I believe it was to the minute. Um, and that way you could absolutely know who to pay off to. But another way to sort of confuse the, um, the so-called authorities would be is if you only bet uh, by the day and not the moment. So you could only say, you know, like uh, December 22nd or of 2018 or whatever. Um, now, what that would mean is you might have, uh, you know, a few dozen or a few thousand gamblers on that particular date. Um, so the would-be assassin could maybe pick a date with less, uh, with less people on it that he was, whatever right. number he was comfortable betting on the same uh, date. And then, uh, sure, he would have to split the pool with all those other people. But then how is any government going to decide which of that, let's say there's 500 bettors on, you know, December 22nd, 2018, well, how is the government going to possibly find that many anonymous? If you use like Monero, like you're saying, uh, which is almost impossible to to find, somebody would have to make a serious mistake to get caught. But then, if you multiply that by five thousand five hundred betters, then sure, he's going to get less of the money. But and that's safer. just one way. Uh, it would be safer. But on the other hand, you could have competing. Uh, you could have competing Deadpool's too, yes. where some are down to the second. I mean, why not have? Why, why limit it to one? You could have as many of those as the market would provide. But I think it's a great idea. Right on, Ron. Yeah, I I really do like that. Uh, you know, yeah, I I really like the I guess the the kind of change that could be made to that. Um, and uh, you know, even then, even then, uh, I mean, as, as far as you know, the assassin getting found out or them having to weed through those 500 people, they would have to actually be able to have a list of 500 people to actually you know start investigating. And uh, yeah, I uh, I I'm not a developer or programmer, but from everything I've seen on Monero. Uh, it is damn near impossible, if not impossible, to locate, uh, you know, the individual sending the transaction. So uh, I, I, I honestly think, I honestly think this is uh, one of the the greatest ways for true justice. Uh, and beyond that, um, I mean, for recruiting individuals in the second realm, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it could be a, a pretty pretty uh, you know incredible thing. But uh, Jason, I'll turn it over to you, man. What do you think? Uh, I'm over here just kind of geeking on the idea. Um... <laughs> yeah, if government it's agents a, getting sounds... fucking killed by assassins, I know it's a great thought, right? <laughs> uh, well, okay, that's part of it, yeah. But <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just enjoying this conversation, you guys. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's tremendous, uh, a brain exercise. But my opinion on it is, is why isn't it being done yet? I mean, I know there, I know there was a couple. There was a, a, a couple people that tried it before, and, and I know Monero is relatively new, and it's not as popular as Bitcoin or, or Bitcoin Cash or any of that other stuff right now. But this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of idea that spawns other ideas. Right. And and it's – god damn it, you guys. Like I blockchain, Monero, this assassin, Deadpools, this is like – yeah, I'm right. sorry. I'm, I'm my my mind's going like 900 miles an hour, and my tongue is only going three right now. <laughs> right, but you know, I and, and I, this is actually great because um, one uh, one individual, uh, I, I guess I'll start with a with a with a good part of this first. Well, actually, one of the blockchain groups I'm in, um, assassination politics was brought up, and it wasn't by me. So I was like, yes, 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 yes. Um, great, you're talking about it. So I obviously chimed in and had some fun with that. Um, but uh, um, but you know, this idea is getting out there. One uh, pretty popular. Um, person, I don't think it'd be a very, uh, you know, uh, good individual. Um, actually, had Jim Bell on. It was an awful interview, and I was frustrated listening to the entire thing because I could have conducted a lot better interview with him. But, <clears throat> but regardless, I, I'm right there with you, Jason. On you know why the hell hasn't this been developed? And I've talked about this in previous podcasts. But something that I have to keep in mind um, is that the blockchain technology is only around for eight or nine years, and there are 
easier, you know, less less risky things that, uh, you know, that, that do need solutions, uh, that need, do need solutions, you know, in the here and now. Um, you know, things with censorship, things with, um, you know, uh, contracts out like, uh, I guess, uh, contracting outside of the out of the outside of the state and, uh, you know, a bunch of other things like that where, where they're very low risk, um, if any risk at all. And uh, they are solutions that need or they are, they are problems that need solutions. So so there is that. And also, too, well, I guess not, not also, too, but uh, for these higher risk, um, I guess, high risk and higher reward. Right. Um, for these sort of things, uh, you know, it's it hasn't been that long. And I have to, I, I have to remind myself too, Jason. God, like it's, why isn't this here yet? Well, it hasn't been around that long. It's only been nine yeah. years, and just look at all of the progress that has happened since then. So, um, got to be patient. It's, it's frustrating because I, I will, you know, I might die of happiness uh, when one of these gets, gets opened up, and you know, things start happening. Hey, uh, yeah, can I throw in there, please go ahead, Ben. Um, you know, uh, um, when Ross, uh, well, no, 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 let me back this up. When the Dread Pirate Roberts first uh, started setting up um, the the Silk Road and um, whoever that uh, might have actually been the original one, um, there was a lot of this kind of talk, uh, not about assassination politics, but about making something function that currently wasn't functional. And there were several different attempts, but the Silk Road was probably the best of its day. Um, and of course, it was the greatest threat to the government. That's why the government went after it with the kind of gusto that it did. Uh, and one of the problems with the Silk Road was that um, Bitcoin was just not as anonymous as many people believed that it was. And um, they had a lot more faith in it than they should have. And the servers were not uh, properly protected, and the individuals uh, that were, you know, that were running things were too trusting with who the who the admins would be. That's how they ended up with, you know, uh, uh, two different government agents as admins on the Silk Road, and um, and so all those were blunders. But you know, uh, when I first started to learn how to walk and stuff, I was pretty bad at it. And even by the time that I was like, uh, I think I was four years old and, um, and I busted the front, one of my front teeth out, a baby tooth, um, you know, because I was so clumsy bouncing around and that's what we do when we're young. But the internet is now a little older and all of us are a little wiser and we have our balance a little bit better. And, uh, you know, I, I can really see this being done correctly and it's something we're not going to get a whole lot of shots at. We're going to we're going to have to really think it through and pull it off correctly the first time because the second time uh, you, we don't want to happen what happened with the Silk Road, where the whole thing gets dumped on one guy who may or may not have even been the, the original Dread Pirate Roberts. And this would be um, a little more severe. Yeah, there Just they will touch. come after this guy. I I talk in my book about that one rogue cop in L.A., I, and his name escapes me, but uh, he decided he was fed up with the LAPD. They were a horrible uh, bunch of people. Go ahead. Char Charles Dorner. Yeah, yeah, Dorner. And uh, he just started going around shooting cops, and the LAPD and every other law enforcement in Southern California lost their minds. They were just shooting anybody that they thought even might be him. Even if it was two poor ladies, just, you know, in a in the completely wrong type of a vehicle, just spreading newspapers in the morning, and they just open up on them and just riddle their truck with bullets. I mean, that's that's how these people react when they're when their little uh, you know um, when their little realm is threatened, and that's what they'll do when this happens. And I say when this happens because I have confidence that this is gonna we're we're gonna see it. I hope to see it still in my lifetime, but. You know, you guys are a bit younger than me, and I'm very confident that you will see successful Deadpools or something like this happening. Right, right. Yeah. And, 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 and Ben, you know, I, I just want to say I love your analogies and metaphors. They're, they're fantastic. But, but yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. It's, it's got to be done right the first time. And I guess this might be the one difficulty uh, in this. So it would all have to be done, you know, very, very privately and securely. So, um, I mean, if you go on the deep web, uh, you know, it's, it's recommended, not a requirement, but you'd be a moron not to do it to, to, you know, put your address and your information, uh, in there, if you're getting something shipped to you, uh, you know, via PGP. So, um, pretty good privacy for, for email. If you, if you, if you guys don't have that yet, uh, not you guys, but if the listeners don't have that, um, Kyle, uh, did, uh, two tutorials on it, one for Mac and one for, 
uh, PC or for Windows. And uh, if you have any difficulties, please shoot me an email. I would be more than happy to help you get it set up. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Once you get it done once, it'll work flawlessly, and uh, I, I love using it. But, but yeah, it would have to be done very very securely. Uh, and it would require, uh, you know, some, some technical loopholes that people would have to get through, or I guess technical difficulties, uh, even for the, for some of the folks that aren't, uh, you know, very technical. Um, so I guess the only way that could be solved, and I don't know how this could be done securely, uh, off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's some smart programmers and developers where it all just comes stock, uh, on, yeah. you know, say whatever, whatever, you know, Deadpool this is where all of this comes stock. Um, you know, the PGP key, if, uh, if it's going to be, if there's going to be any communication off the record, uh, you know, instant messaging communication, all of it would have to be done very, very securely. So that would be the only, because unfortunately, guys, I'm sure you're, you're aware of this too, but um, with, with a lot of blockchain technology, uh, you know, you, you kind of uh, learn about it. Oh my God, this will be great. And it's like, yeah, go into your, com your, uh, your command line code and, uh, you know, uh, you've got to do some very specific coding there and then you can use the service. And it's like, yeah. Uh, not very user friendly, not very, you know, not, uh, you know, wide adoption. And for something like an assassination market or, or Deadpool, it has to be easy enough where a lot of people can, you know, uh, predict or I guess bet on the time when this person will die uh, or else no one will, you know, have that financial incentive to do so. So I think that might be just one drawback right now, uh, but I'm sure it's something programmers and developers can figure out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Going, going back to Ben's book again, he says that uh, um, the market will, the, the market will kill the state when it's ready. And, and it's true, you know, every, every day, every single day, technology is advancing and, and the free market technology, blockchain, um, uh, free source technology is advancing a hell of a lot faster than the government can keep up with it. Uh, because as we know, the government is reactionary and not, uh, they, they don't, they don't take charge. So the, the, the market will make this happen when the technology, um, is at a point that it can effectively make it happen. Yep. Right. Right. And I guess one other thing, and this will be kind of an argument for Avenging Angels, which is next, um, but with assassination politics too, outside of just being a, uh, you know, true justice, kind of a change in mindset for, for those in the state of survival society. Um, it could also, uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> it could, uh, you know, if a lot of people are getting a lot of uh, government interest being capped, uh, and, uh, you know, that, that wouldn't be a very good line of employment to go into. People would just, you know, not want to do that position. Uh, but furthermore, even if, uh, uh, you know, this, you know this, these individuals didn't think they would be targeted for any reason, uh, even then, uh, it would be, uh, it would make them, uh, <laughs> they, would be, they would think twice uh, about, you um, I guess harassing any uh, any Vanuan in a second realm if these deadly ramifications are going to come from it. So it might be one of those things where uh, it's just uh, it's like Title IV flag code where it just goes unenforced because um, for that for obviously for that reason you know they want people to be you know statists and, and um, you know nationalists and all that nonsense. But but for this purpose I mean uh, yeah you know unenforced well uh, all right guys which one of you wants to die today? Uh, not me Bob. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that would also yep. be another thing too. Yeah, when when you make when you make enforcement of the state more dangerous than than the state itself, that's yeah. when you'll start having real freedom. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, who who did that? I stole a um, um, oh wow Bastiat quote and posted it, uh, reposted it on Twitter today with some comments and pointing back at my book that uh, Bastiat says that when um, you know when when uh, plunder becomes uh, painless then more people plunder but you have to make the plunder painful now i believe bastiat was actually talking about making it painful to the people and they'll stop the government from doing it but it works in both directions if you make plunder pa painful to the ones who are plundering then uh eventually they're gonna get a real job yeah yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's definitely true. So so overall, I think our or that the consensus here is that assassination uh, markets, assassination politics, Deadpool is whatever you're going to call them, um, could be you know very very you know great for uh, building the second realm and also kind of more in line with, uh, with with what you discussed in your book, Ben. Uh, yeah, but you know abolishing the state if uh, there's no one there to take those jobs, then uh, then yeah, the, the problem kind of solves itself, right? Yeah. All right, good. Any uh, any other thoughts on that, guys? Uh, no. I'm ready to move on to Avenging Angel. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. So, so yes, Avenging Angels. And uh, I'll, what I'll do here 
since uh, this is out of uh, Rayo's book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, and it's only about, uh, it's a long paragraph, but it's uh, actually, no, it's not a long paragraph, this is a size 14 font. Um, it's just a paragraph where he explains this concept. And uh, so I'll read that in its entirety. And uh, if you do want to pick up that book for free, just go to vanupodcast.com and click on the free books tab uh, there right at the top. And if you want to, you know, read about, uh, you know, 10 other uh, Lib Vanu or Libertarian publications from the 60s through the 80s uh, for absolutely free, I'm not going to put anything behind a paywall, guys, uh, then uh, you can just go just go to vanupodcast.com and search Vanu publications. I still haven't gotten those updated to the free books tab yet, but, uh, but they're all there uh, for free downloads. So let's get to it. Quote. One simple retaliatory mechanism is available right now to many libertarian to many libertarians. And let me step in. This was in the 1960s, guys. So keep that in mind whenever, uh, whenever uh, you're, you're listening to this. Quote: One simple retaliatory mechanism is available right now to many libertarians. An individual puts part of his savings in a cache or Swiss account accessible to a friend and makes the following agreement: If he is arrested, so long as he remains incarcerated, his friend each month withdraws a certain sum and spend this, spends this for whatever will cause the offending government agency maximum annoyance and disability. If the individual should be executed, all of his earmarked savings are so expended. This friend is contractually obligated to carry through the retaliation. Even if the victim cannot stop it while incarcerated, this prevents possible intimidation should the agreement be found out. This agreement is presumably kept secret. The agency and the individual bureaucrats would, however, be told for what they are being punished. It would be pointed out that their victim was not only minding his own business, but was acting in accordance with clear-cut moral principles, that he was not merely a common criminal. One of the herd gone astray. Through, uh, though such a retaliatory, uh, uh, excuse me, through such a retaliatory agreement, the victim not only increases chances for release, but gains a certain satisfaction. So long as he remains in jail, what better use could he make of his savings? Whether or not retaliation should be limited to legal activities is beyond the scope of this letter, uh, end quote. So the idea here, guys, is to use Pavlovian psychology uh, to, to, you know, to persuade the state, hey, guys, uh, you know, you've you got you've got you've got a couple of our guys. You, you know what happened, right? Uh, you probably shouldn't do that kind of along the same lines as assassination politics. So and I think this is where your uh, simple sabotage portion of your book, Ben, really comes into play uh, with, uh, you know, causing the state, uh, you know, annoyance. That's kind of seems like the uh, the theme of, uh, of that chapter, I guess, in a sense. So uh, what do you think, Ben? Oops, sorry. I had my mic muted. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um... I'm going to sort of adapt a real quick uh, shot out of the book to uh, Avenging Angels um, way of thinking. So there's a section in there that talks about if you – if you let's say you have a, a landscaping company and you want to do this kind of thing, then here's a few ideas on, on how you can do this. So let me just switch that around a little bit. Let's say, let's say you have an Avenging Angels situation like you just described, and um, let's say me – I, I have put away a hundred thousand dollars and like if I could do that, but let's just say that I've put away a hundred thousand dollars and um, and I've made a, an arrangement with you, Shane, that uh, you will take that out as you need to do these things just like what you described. Okay, now let's say let's say you're not a landscaper. Let's say you have the the job you have and you do the things you have, but you're halfway decent at, um, uh, convincing people of things in person. So you, you know that the, let's say the district attorney where I'm arrested at and being held, a lot of the decision on whether or not I'm going to be uh, tried will be based on that district attorney. If he just goes to the judge and say, Hey, we're just, we're dropping this case on this guy. We just don't have enough. Then judges almost always will drop the case that it almost never goes in any other direction. Um, so Let's say, uh, Shane, that you go to the house, you do a little investigation, you find out that the district attorney has a real nice house with a very nice, well-kept uh, yard. And you also realize that he, he, both he and his wife are gone during the day and the house is empty. They don't have any servants that are there during the day. And so you go to that house and you park, you know, at, at least close enough to where you can stand in front of the house with your cell phone and you call a landscaping company and you say, Hey, I, I really want to surprise my wife. She's out of town for a couple of days. I need for you to come over here. If you can come today and if not, you know, you can also arrange it for another day and just have to show up twice, but that just increases the risk. And so the, the landscaper guy comes out, meets you in front of the district attorney's house. You introduce yourself as the district attorney and tell him this is your house 
that you have to leave, but what you'd like for them to do is remove all the sod in from the entire front yard, <laughs> take down the trees, and uh, you know, and remove all the uh, all the flowers and all the bushes and everything, because uh, you're, you're going to want a whole new uh, operation. And um, and you tell the guy that you want this done in one day because you want to surprise your wife when she gets home from work this evening. You want the whole thing done before she gets home from work this evening. All right. Then the landscaping company, you thank them and pay them in advance for the work. And then you leave because you tell them, I've got to get back to court. I'm just over here for a little while. I've got to get back to court. And so they go to work and they rip out all the sod and cut down the guy's trees and tear out all of his, his uh, you know, shrubbery and his flowers and everything and clean the whole place out. And then they leave and uh, the wife and the, <laughs> and the real district attorney come home about the same time and they're like, what happened to our yard? Well, even if there are witnesses, they're going to get a hold of the police are going to get a hold of this landscaping company and they can't prosecute the landscaping company. They didn't do anything illegal. <laughs> and then, you know, that's one time and that's what's that going to cost? Uh, you know, five, seven hundred dollars out of that hundred thousand. Now multiply that out in your brain and think about how many times you can do stuff like that just to that prosecutor. Uh, and you could even go so far as to, you know, uh, Use uh, some some method, just use your imagination and get a note to him and say, every time you don't release this so-and-so, he knows nothing about what we're doing. He has no control about what we're doing. But if you don't release him, we're going to continue doing this kind of stuff to you. And your whole life is going to be like this. Get used to it. <laughs> oh, that is the ultimate in gaslighting. That, I absolutely yeah. love that. That's fantastic, um, and, it, and it's not um, it's it's not something like uh, um, like there are obviously some strategies where uh, you know they could be very very risky and could involve some violence, but that's just such an annoyance. Um, and I would love to see uh, you know that uh, you know that kind of uh, you know local attorney or, or maybe it's a state attorney, you know, try to like label that as terrorism. Uh, <laughs> and it's like it's like and they go through the details, and it's like, dude, that's. Come on, come on! Like, are you, are you kidding me? Um, but but yeah, that would that would be incredible, man. That's I love that example. <laughs> go ahead, Ben. That, go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just I just like I could just picture his face as he's pulling up in his eighty thousand dollar car, and there's no grass, no shrubs, no trees, and just being like, just <laughs> flabbergasted. <laughs> Another good one, just stealing again from my book is uh, you're standing next to the district attorney's car. Let's say he, you know that he, you know, goes to a certain place or a certain thing, goes shopping in a certain place or, or whatever, but you've watched him enough to know his patterns and you know that his car is going to be at a certain public location at a certain time. Well, you go there and stand next to it with a very annoying look on your face. You call a wrecker. He comes out. And you say, this stupid car has got all these security systems, and, and I, I can't do a thing with it, and uh, it's all locked up. It won't work. And please tow my car to this very, you know, to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the Mercedes dealer. All I need to do is get it from the Kroger to the Mercedes dealer, and here's the advantage. You know, I'll pay in advance. Here you go. Just get it. Or you, um, you can call and do it over, over the phone with a credit card so that you don't even have to be there. You just say, my car... Uh, you know, is there, it's located in this parking spot, go get the car, take it to the Mercedes dealer. The guy comes walking out, you know, from the, from whatever he's shopping, you know, Walmart or whatever. And it's like, and oh, my car got stolen, my brand new Mercedes. They're not supposed to be able to do that. So he's like calling Mercedes, having them shut it down. Cause they have those security features where they can just shut the car down wherever it's at. And they're like, it's at the dealer. <laughs> why are you why are you <laughs> calling it in stolen? It's at the dealer. Oh my god! Yeah, man. This, this that's that's death by a thousand paper cuts. That would be not only not only would that be a very effective, but that would be fun. That would be very very fun. Um, and uh, like I I as soon as you started telling that story about the landscaper, I had this this flashback to a story that I heard about a very popular motorcycle club here on the west coast. Uh, and how they had a when when a brother would get arrested, every time the prosecutor turned around, there would be members of the club. Right, they would follow their vehicles. If they went grocery <laughs> shopping, somebody would somebody would mirror them in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, if they went to their kid's soccer game, 
there would be members of the club at the kids' soccer game. And it's it, it puts the idea in your head of it it's it puts the idea in your head that these is is, is it really worth it, right? Is yeah. is the harassment worth it? Is the fear worth it? Is the is the the inconveniences, is it really worth it to prosecute this person for their 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 petty crimes for for their their cannabis possession or for running running a website in which nobody ever got hurt it 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 puts the idea in their head and and it goes to the point where the prosecutor it has to enter in his head at some point or or her head at some point it has to enter in their head is is this more dangerous is 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 what i'm doing worth it is is the the is this job worth my own life or my own my my family's safety or our home is 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 the juice worth the squeeze and in a lot of these cases when when push comes to shove a lot of these cases they'll 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 back down the the mob the mob is famous the mob had built is literally built on on intimidation yeah um and and harassment is just another form of intimidation yeah, oh, yeah. definitely yeah yeah so i i guess for, for for this one i mean it's more it's it's not about i guess um and, and this and this might not even be record, reported to the media i mean it might just be you know relegated to the i guess to the individual you know uh, government agent that's uh, you know that's that's dealing with uh, uh this avenging angel but uh, uh, as far as, you know, assist helping to build the second realm, helping to maintain the second realm, helping to keep, uh, you know, the new ones out of, uh, out of uh, you know, rape cages, uh, I think it's uh, certainly, it, and Rail proposed this in the 1960s, uh, and this was the only time, I mean, he was not about confronting this, directly confronting the state, he just wanted to disappear. Um, if you, you know, if you become invisible to the coercers, they can coerce you, that was kind of his thing. So seeing this in his book is kind of contrary to his, his character, although it is very very specific in its goals, which is to, you know, using Pavlovian psychology to uh, to teach the state, you know, it's kind of like slapping the hand, nope, don't do that, nope, don't do that, and, uh, you know, eventually maybe they'll, maybe they'll stop. I mean, I, I don't know if it, I don't know if it actually work, but at the same time, this is kind of a, a, a possibility. I, I think it's a, it's a pretty swell one. It could definitely assist in building the second realm and also maintaining it, but what do you guys think? Absolutely, I think it could. I, I think it I think it could not not do that. <laughs> I think it, it would be inevitable that a couple things would happen that exactly like you, like you're talking about the the uh, um, the authorities would hesitate and back down more often, and in doing so, the general public would realize, with the help of our uh, above ground network of people pointing out the failures of the state. Um, it would weaken the state in every way. And, event, and you know, how many times you talk to somebody and they're like, well, who would build the roads? Who would provide justice? Who would keep the gangs off the streets? And who would, and if you could answer, you wouldn't even need to answer that question. They wouldn't ask it because it would be so obvious. This is who does it. This is who provides justice. It, you know, it would take that complete argument off the table. Right, right. And I think also too, like it doesn't have to be, you know, the, the Avenging Angels tactics don't have to be, um, now they can be, sure. I mean, and, and, I, and I would think that it would be kind of escalating, right? Um, so the right. first one's the first one is the lawn, the next is the car, and, you know, it just kind of gets worse from there. So I, I do think there'd be a certain point where they'd say, oh my gosh, like, uh, like if we just release him, this will stop. Uh, okay, get him out of here. I'm sick of dealing with this shit. Um, kind, of, yeah, kind of like that, and also, too... Um, uh, like j just imagine if like the, the first step in this was, I'm sure they have, uh, and this is a weird example, but I'm sure they have like, you know, dildo lawn ornaments. Like if, uh, <laughs> if you and kind of a, uh, an avenging angel brigade go out to like, uh, um, I don't know, like a really, you know, well-known judge, like go to his house and just put like a thousand of them in his yard, take a picture. And then just, uh, you know, from obviously like an anonymous untrackable email address, you just send it to like a, a government, you know, gov like a government media, uh, like right. a news organization and uh, have that run and uh you know make sure you send uh you know the letter along with that like uh this is why this is why we're doing it um you know it's gonna get uh it's gonna get funnier just so it's not like a threat it's gonna get more comical as as we move forward uh and uh you know the media you know portrays that and then uh, you know the the story of uh 
of uh, John Smith is a new one who, you know, um, got arrested for some for some some nonsensical thing. Um, then I, I think it could also kind of be a culture jamming thing uh, out to, you know, maybe if it's, uh, you know, local like that, that local kind of uh, uh, that a local town, uh, if it's a bigger city, a bigger city, that that, that kind of audience. And, uh, you know, I think it could be good as kind of a culture jamming effort, too, uh, in that sense. Oh, absolutely. I, I, you can kind of see things like this on, on social media. Um, I'm very active on, on social media, on, on Facebook in particular. And I, I see this a lot where the police, um, the, their Facebook pages, they'll, they'll make a marijuana bust and they'll take pictures smiling, you know, all proud of their marijuana bust. And the photo will go viral for all the wrong reasons. And you will have <laughs> you will have 10,000 comments on that on that photo, calling them bastards, comparing them to revenue agents, uh, uh, prohibition, uh, yeah. talking about. Uh, uh, no victim, no crime, and and rape cages, and and just just these th just all these these statistics about what they're doing is wrong, and 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 how they're only continuing the oppression and and not protecting and serving, not doing the will of the public, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, just imagine that taken to the next level with you know the dildo picture, as as Shane mentioned, or or a person's address and a phone number. And and yeah. just escalating, 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 and using the mass, using using the, the the mob mentality to our advantage, to totally gaslight these people into releasing the people, or or to not even going after people anymore. Um, and right. uh, uh, for 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 simple things like in, in Colorado, in Colorado, they stopped going, they they stopped arresting people for like simple marijuana possession. Or or buying and selling, which technically in Colorado you can you can buy and sell recreationally at a at a legal dispensary, but it's technically illegal to buy and sell outside of a dispensary. So they're still arresting people for it. But jury nullification is is so grand in Colorado that they that they simply stopped arresting people for buying and selling outside of dispensaries. Gotcha, and, gotcha. And, yeah. Yeah, and, and that that sort of thing that can that can be carried over into into real real actions and, and, and into to have larger consequences. Right, right. And I will I will I will posit one, I guess, um I, I guess one one uh one concern. Um there there was a guy up in Michigan that I'm I'm friends with on Facebook. I met him uh, at the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest. Uh there was that um uh, I can't remember the, the, the guy that was uh you know humiliated in the hotel room. Uh, or on the in the hotel uh, on the uh, in the hotel hallway, um, and he got killed. Uh, Shaver Daniel Shaver, I think it was the the really awful yeah. the really awful thing that happened. Um, he, his address and phone number were actually posted, and this guy that in Michigan shared it. And um, you know, one of the uh, the back the bludgies folks uh, reported it to I guess I guess the local. I don't know all the details of it, but um, but he posted a status that said uh, you know finally out of jail. Um, guess you can't post, uh, you know, their public information uh, on on social media. So um, be careful with that. I would say that I don't think they're going to do it. I think it would take a report. But at the same time, uh, that's why that's why with with the Avenging Angel strategies, I think it's a lot better to do it anonymously. If you're on fascist book, use a sock account with a uh, with like a VPN. Uh, oh, yeah. But you you can't t you you can't take enough precautions when it comes to these violent psychopaths in the first realm. So I, I just kind of posit that so I guess maybe that disclaimer that that little warning there. But uh, but many guys. Yeah, yeah. Or actually, Jason, you go ahead if you got something. I I just I just wanted to say yes and take all the precautions you can, but you cannot control the masses. They are they're going to do what they want to do. Right, right. Ben, you got anything, man? Yeah, I'm just you know. This has been a lot of fun talking about all this stuff because there's so many of these things that I want to say every day. And, uh, you know, you rarely get the chance to talk with like-minded people and go over this kind of stuff. I just I, I'm couldn't be happier that we uh, that that not only we that anybody is talking about this. And I am just beside myself honored that I would be one of the people that's saying this in a time because I know this stuff is going to catch on. I know 50 years from now, people are going to at some point go, well, who are the first people that were talking about this kind of stuff? And it's not that I want, you know, glory 50 years from now when I'm going to be dead and gone and buried and rotted. It's not that I want the glory, but I know now 
I'm right about this and you guys are right about this. And knowing that, and we, it's almost like seeing the future. We know this is going to happen. We may not know the exact details, but it's going to happen. All the technology is sitting there waiting for people to tap into it. And the frustration is there with dealing with government. And, you know, more and more we're seeing what these what cops are really like and what all the, like you call them, the bludgies, what they really are and the harm that they're doing when they do things like calling the police or whatever. Um and, and we're right about this, and we literally are seeing the future. Uh, and, you know, now it's just a matter of watching, waiting till it happens. Right, right. And, and I will, I mean, and, I mean, yeah, you know, it's, it's, we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't have this mini series with, without you, Ben. I mean, you're, you're, kind of, you're the guy that wrote the book on a lot of these subjects. So um, yeah, it'd, be, it'd, be, uh, it'd be foolish on our part not to include you. But, um, but I, I will say, and this is kind of uh, and to, to the libertarians and anarchists that, that, that may be listening. Uh, if you're listening to Liberty Under Attack and you've been a long-time listener, you've heard these discussions many, many times before. If it's a direct action series, Guerrilla Warfare, and uh, Just War Theory with Kyle, uh, that was one of the, maybe like the, I don't know, the 12th, 13th episode, something along those lines. Uh, you've heard us talk about assassination politics. You've heard us talk about, um, you know, a lot of these things, these these use of force issues, these subjects that a lot of uh, people get kind of uh, a lot of you know libertarians and anarchists, you know, the zero aggression principle, the non aggression principle, they get kind of uh, you know queasy about. That's not kind of uh, you know they they you, you, a lot of a lot of folks want to you just win minds, like you just present the arguments, and uh, this can all be done non violently. But that's contrary to human history, and uh, I know that's unfortunate to hear, but. Uh, I mean, you, you can't you can't count uh, you, you can't count that out. You you just can't. And and Ben uh, and Jason and this is something that Kyle and I have been uh, maybe complaining is not the right word, but you know really trying to really trying to I guess start the discussion. Uh, obviously, you know the direct action series uh, and the freedom umbrella of direct action are all about strategies strategies and tactics to increase personal freedom, and use of force issues are one of those things that have to be discussed. It is kind of unfortunate, though. It is kind of unfortunate that with, with a lot of libertarians and anarchists, generally speaking, um, the use of force issues are almost almost you know exclusively relegated to peaceful parenting, use of force, and spanking a child. Um, now, that's a topic for another discussion, but it has to go beyond that. It has to go beyond that. If you look at the entire span of human history, the state is a violent, you know, tyrannical apparatus. Even Samuel Konkin with agorism, Starve the state, then smash it. And what does smashing include? Well, it, inv it involves killing bludgies. That's what it comes down to. And it may be an uneasy thought to think about in thinking about, uh, you know, assassination politics or anarchist vigilantes, um, you know, doing these things or even, you know, avenging angels. It might be an uncomfortable thought, but uh, I think it's something that needs to be broached. Uh, obviously, mentally first, wrap your head around it, and then join us in discussing these strategies and tactics. Hey, uh, can I throw in one other thing that from my notes that I forgot to touch earlier? Please, please. Um, in the, There's a great book. If you haven't read it, it's kind of thick, and I don't like the writing style, but uh, the name of it is The Art of Not Being Governed, An Anarchist History of Upland Southeast Asia by James Scott. And James C. Scott is an anarchist. Uh, I believe he's with Ye uh, Professor at Yale, if I recall. And... Um, and I would say that if, if Scott and I sat down and talked, we'd find a lot of things we disagree with as far as the, the role of the market and because he's a little bit more of a lefty leaning than I am. But, um, but he talks about in there tribal societies and how a big man, that's you know, often the words that are translated into English that describe the leader of their village or, or their tribe or whatever, uh, it translates to big man. And if the big man gets too um, powerful or too rich or too pushy for the the basic tribal for the rest of the tribe, um, they'll just have a discussion about it. And this has gone on, you know, going back into antiquity long before any words were ever written on anything. This is how tribal societies dealt with the big man. Um, they just have a lottery, and then they'd go whoever won the lottery or lost. Uh, would go kill him. And so if he was big enough and tough enough that one person couldn't do it by themselves, then they'd get a, a committee and they would go kill him. Uh, and that, by setting the example with the big man, whoever the next big man was, he wasn't so big. He he didn't push people around so much. He didn't make sure that that he was a burden to the people that he was supposed to be leading. And, you know, if James C. Scott 
uh, is far more eloquent, even though I kind of dissed his, his writing uh, talents there. He's far more eloquent than I am. And his description of it in that book is, uh, is pretty accurate. And he, you know, according to him, the area he calls Zomia, uh, which is a very large, ungovernable area in Southeast Asia, still lives that way today. And the governments don't dare go in there and mess with those people and arrest them because they know that the long-term pain is far worse than, you know, than it, what it's worth to go in and get some guy who's selling the wrong substance or whatever. Right, right. Yeah. And that book's been on my reading list for a while. I need to, I need to actually, you know, read it, but you know, busy, 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 busy. <laughs> and there are about a million, there's a lifetime of, uh, you know, a lifetime of books on the, uh, on the reading list. But, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of it, right? I mean, they, they, you know, uh, uh, you know, they, they killed, they kill their government, government agents too. Right. So, um, it's, uh, uh, again, it might be a subject that's kind of, un, uh, kind of queasy for folks to think about. And, uh, especially so when I, when I did the book or the book review on, uh, Erwin Strauss's, uh, how to start your own country. Uh, yeah, the thought of libertarians having nuclear weapons as a means of deterrence is also kind of a queasy thought. But if you're going to start your own country, uh, you know, you're, you're playing status games at that point. So uh, if that's not what you want to do, then uh, you might want to find a different occupation. Uh, <clears throat> Roger Bear and the Free Society Foundation. But um, <laughs> anyways, anyways. <laughs> All, all that said, I, I guess that I guess that kind of concludes the Avenging Angels section. So, so overall, I mean, we, we've talked about uh, anarchist vigilantes. We've talked about assassination politics and, and Avenging Angels. And and, and the, the goal of this of this this episode was to to, to kind of suss out uh, whether whether or not uh, you know killing government agents is uh, you know a way to help build the second realm or in, or in a couple instances uh, to maintain the second realm. So, um, so overall thoughts, kind of kind of a, a conclusionary conclusionary thoughts. Um, do you guys think uh, overall that these strategies are are good for those purposes? And if Ben, you want, if you want to, or Ben or Jason, if you guys want to also kind of relate that to to abolishing the state, uh, please feel free. But uh, but Jason, we'll start with you this time, Ian. Uh, I I believe that these are not only capable of of helping to to build the second realm. I believe that these are necessary steps in order to build in the second realm. Uh, and they're not the only ones. They are absolutely not the only ones. But they are. They are. There are steps that we will have to take, uh, our or our children will have to take, or our grandchildren will have to take whenever the market is ready to kill the state. Um, th these are things that they they have to happen because the the state will never die easy. The 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 status mentality will not die easily. It's not going to just. It's not gonna. It's not gonna wither up and die like a leaf that's fallen off a tree. No, you. It's it's gonna take a, a lot of work and uh, a lot of. There's gonna be some heartache and and there's gonna be some blood. Um, and there's there's, there's be more Russell bricks, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, and there's gonna be a lot of Russell bricks because the the state the state will will lash out at anybody it can and punish them in any way they can. Um. Yeah, this is. It's it's not going to be easy, but these are the kind of things that that need to happen. These are the kind of discussions that have to happen and and can't be avoided. If if, if you are if you are not willing to have these type of discussions, then you're not truly ready to help in the state. Right. And if I may step in for 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 one second, I just just toss this in there real quick. So so right now, I mean, yeah, the the bludgies, the, the bludgies are out there, and you know they murder a lot of. Uh, uh, innocent civilians and, and minor traffic stops and things. Sure, I mean that that's out there. But 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 what if what if things get? Uh, what if I think it's more of a uh, win uh, win win here. But uh, um, when things get get really bad, where um, you know maybe uh, you know posse comitatus is completely thrown out the window, and uh, you literally have uh, a military. Uh, patrolling uh, the, the streets of America, and uh, you know they're killing your family. Um, you know they're they're raiding your house in the middle of the night uh, to try to find uh, uh, to try to find these, uh, these these terrorists, so to speak, right? Um, if you haven't even if you haven't even, haven't even haven't even begun to to consider the idea that okay, you know maybe some maybe you know in defense of you know my autonomy and defense of my family, maybe at some point I, I will have to to take an action that I'm not you know really happy to take. Um, if you haven't even considered the prospect mentally and uh, discussed it to try to try to understand or, 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 or learned how to actually do some of these things if you have to, if you haven't even crossed that step and uh, you know that, that situation comes into fruition, then uh, uh, you're, you're, you're basically helpless. You're basically helpless. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's uh, – so 
Hopefully, it's it, just just like with a firearm, right? Uh, with self-defense, you you you, you want to have it. Uh, you want to have it uh, in case you you'd rather have it when you uh, don't need it than not have it when you need it. Um, I think that that kind of goes uh, the same way here. So, um, so Jason, do you have any thought there, or uh, do you have a thought there? Uh, I just I just I just wanted to to, to bring up real quick. You you said the uh, the, the the state. Okay, Chicago right now. There are politicians in Chicago wanting to bring in the UN to police their streets because of because of supposed gun violence. Mm -hmm. If if that idea doesn't just enrage you to, to no end, then you're listening to the wrong podcast and go stick your head in a hole. <laughs> yep. And just uh, another another thought there. The first article I ever wrote for Liberty Under Attack was uh, it was titled uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, Complicity in Establishing the American American Police State, and uh, that was what he was in favor of. There were actually newspaper uh, um, newspaper headlines back in uh, I remember when it was 1960s. Uh, UN peacekeepers. The the idea was to gauge down uh, you know. Um, you know, like the U.S. military, Russian military, and just you know, turn everything over to the U.N. And if you watch or listen to, and there may be anarchists out there still, I still see these stupid fucking memes going around that, uh, you know, two out of three of these presidents, uh, you know, believe in world government. And John F. Kennedy's like an ex because he didn't. Uh, bullshit. Listen to his speech, uh, you know, back in the 1960s uh, to the United Nations. Uh, he was very much in favor of world government. He was very much in favor of disarming everybody in the world. And uh, this shouldn't even be a conversation we're having as, uh, you know, as an yeah. Yep. his podcast yep. but uh yep. but kill, anyway sorry yeah, go ahead jason kill kill your great man <laughs> right yep. kill your great man yep <sighs> exactly exactly so sorry sorry ben go ahead man no no i agree with everything you just said and especially with that john f kennedy's i get so tired of people take one tiny little quote of his half out of context and they're like see what a great man he was no he wasn't he was a piece of trash just, you know, he crossed the wrong people in government, just like, you know, others have and died for it. But, you know, he was still a piece of trash just because he died. But but no, everything, everything both of you guys just said and Jason, too, you know, I I really agree with that. Um, and, you know, we just all it, it I, I believe this so much that I almost believe and I don't even need to do anything because you guys are going to – not you two, but, but talking to the audience. But you guys are going to do it, so I don't even need to. I can go rest now. You know, I, I almost am that point of confidence of this happening where a few years ago I was just, you know, metaphorically pounding my head against a table saying, why can't people see this? And now I'm to the point of where I can just almost say, ah, my work is done. I can go rest. Right, right, and yeah, you've definitely done your work. Feel feel free to rest, and I mean, um, I, I guess uh, so. Ben, I guess overall, do you think these strategies are, uh, you know, um, kind of the question I asked Jason? Do you think these uh, are strategies, you know, um, that are going to help build a second realm and also maintain it? And again, in, in context of your book, do you think these things can also help in the state? Is kind of an inclusionary uh, question. Yeah, and I really do think the second realm, as uh, Vanu describes it. Um, is a step in that direction is an absolute necess and a ne necessary step in that direction. And again, it's going to happen, uh, on some scale. And I love the idea of, you know, under a factory of some kind or under, uh, as in, um, breaking bad. I mean, you can right now, there's so much wealth being generated through the cryptocurrency boom that if some of those people were to use that wisely, um, these things can very quickly and very easily come into fruition. Uh, you know, uh, I think of um, Cody Wilson's work with these desktop milling machines. And, you know, oh, man. You yeah, de actually defense distributed. Yeah, defense distributed. You can actually manufacture, uh, you know, military grade uh, weapons. Um, at a price far cheaper than you can buy them, you, it, it's, it's cost effective to buy one of these things and make these weapons and sell them, you know. Um, so it's just a matter of time until uh, somebody, some, bill, some Bitcoin millionaire or whatever is going to come into our way of thinking like we're talking about here. And there's going to be maybe, you know, under a laundry service in Albuquerque, 
you know, somebody's going to have the forethought before the thing is built to build an underground under it. And it's going to happen. We may not know about it. It may already be in existence, you know, um, but it's, it's going to happen. And that by establishing the second realm and by that functioning, it is inevitable that the state will then uh, begin that wobbling and eventually topple. Right, right, and and, and uh, I, we haven't done the like we're, we're getting into season three, and that's when Kyle and I have talked about this a lot. The Vanu and Cities approach, like the the uh, um, the industrial parks, uh, the industrial business parks. Oh my gosh, um, is there some potential there? Um, you know, I just wish that hundred million dollars that was going to the Free Society Fund, or that's already you know been privately donated, not open to the public. Uh, that a lot could be done with that million dollar, hundred million dollars that could be used for, uh, you know, far likelier purposes other than just handing over Bitcoin uh, to a fucking government. Yeah. Um, in exchange for land that uh, is not going to have any defense capabilities whatsoever. So what do states do they take them over? So it's just going to be a waste of a hundred million dollars. Um, not a pessimistic view at all. It's just looking at uh, history. I, I wrote an article on uh, uh, seasteading case studies, and uh, you want to know about there are probably five uh, case studies. You know what happened to three of them? Um, their releases, uh, their releases or agreements with governments, and what did the governments do? They took them over. Yeah. Um, you know, they broke their agreement. So. Surprise! Uh, surprise so yeah, you're 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 exact. <laughs> right, right. So I I I think the the. the the Vanu and Cities approach, or I guess the Second Realm and Cities approach, uh, you know, kind of the uh, the hidden bedchamber, the the like a, like Aurora and Alongside Night. Um, I think those are you know very viable possibilities um, if if there could be some capital, put those into fruition. And obviously, don't don't say don't talk about it over a podcast. Right. But I think that's needless to say. But um, but yeah, I uh, and what you mentioned the uh, the CNC uh, machining thing. You want to talk about uh, you know arming a. Uh, um, you know, a uh, <laughs> ethic, uh, an ethics-based uh, regular uh, warfare, you know, brigade. Uh, you guys pitch in like uh, 500 bucks uh, a pop, or or if you have like you know, you know, 50 people, toss it, you know, however much it would be, 100 bucks a pop, and you guys can have your fun making all the weapons you could possibly need. So, um, you want to talk about uh, you know, versus when Ray was doing this, uh, the technology that's advanced, you know, to this point. Uh, oh man, it's it's, I agree with you, Ben. It's 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 gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Uh, I, I I I I hope in my lifetime. I want to see it. I want to see it. So, um, I guess I'll turn it to you guys for for any any other closing thoughts you may have. I, I'm pretty Go good. I think uh, I think I've uh, uh, you know, jabbered as much as what was on my mind. Uh, I just all right. Awesome. I I just I just want to say. Thank you to Ben for for doing this for what you for this book. This book, as as I said before, when I first read it, when it was first introduced to me, um, I was I was skeptic, right? I was the oh, we just need to change people's minds, and when enough people change their minds, then the state will just you know d disappear into a giant unicorn fart. <laughs> and and reading this book, it was it was like a light switch. It really was like like a, a light switch came on and something reached out and grabbed me, and and everything was illuminated and it was just like, this this is important, which is why I am so adamant about helping promote the book and 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 making the memes and and the Facebook page and and sharing on Twitter, and doing podcasts like this. I was I did not sleep last night because I was so excited about getting on this podcast and and being able to talk to you and and the, especially this topic, and and for those people out there that are listening, no matter how how much you disagree or or how much you how how peaceful you think you are, uh, as Aristotle said, it's the mark of an educated mind to entertain a thought without accepting it. So go entertain yourself. Go read this book. Go read Sedition's version of Sabotage. Um, Badquicker.com. It's you can. It's free to download PDF. There's an audio book on, on Liberty Under Attack. Uh, the Facebook page, Badquicker.com. That is D-O-T-C-O-M. Uh, and just read some of it. Just if just just read just read a little bit. And if you can read 10, 15, 20 pages and and nothing reaches out and grabs you. Then you're not ready. It, that's it's as simple as that. You are either ready or you are not, and this book will be the light switch that that makes you ready. 
Right, and, and just to step in, step in, you know, I guess uh, one one more time here until the until the conclusion. But, um, and obviously, uh, you know, as Ben said, you know, with even with a simple sabotage, a lot of people aren't capable of doing uh, capable of you know doing those things. But like I said, just you know, mentally be prepared and and you know think about it and and figure out you know the best strategies and tactics for kind of doing some of these things if you ever need to. Um, I mean, I, I I don't think I'm suited for for this sort of thing. I've got type one diabetes, man. I couldn't you know be on kind of a real warfare scenario, I don't think, um, it'd be a little difficult. So, um, even if, you know, even if you're not one of those folks, will be on the front line, so to speak. Um, I still think it's just important to think about. It's important to think about and kind of, uh, you know, I don't know. Thinking is a good thing. Thing is a good thing. So, all right. Anything else guys or just no. thanks for, thanks for having me on and thanks for let's having this discussion. Yep. Not a problem, not a problem. And I want to second kind of Jason's thoughts there, Ben, that, uh, you know, I, I appreciate all your all, all your work. And unfortunately, man, I, I, I haven't listened to as much of your podcast as I, as I would have as I would have liked to. Um, I, I do have one question. I went and tried to look it up on, uh, you know, the Apple podcast and it wasn't there. Um, yeah, I, I did look on the website and it is on Android. But uh, um, is there a, a purpose that you don't have that on iTunes or, or, or like that that available on iTunes or, or, or what? It used to be on iTunes, and they only published whatever the last 50 uh, episodes were or the most recent 50 episodes. And uh, it may have dropped it. I don't know if it's still on there or not. Probably through inactivity because there hasn't been a new one since like uh, – yeah, maybe. Uh, I yeah. think I think January of 2015, Cody Wilson and I finished the – the final podcast, so it's probably just because of its age. Um, okay. They are archived at badquaker.com, but they're not real obvious to get to. You have to click on a month, or you have to you do a search for a particular you know topic you're thinking of. I have started to take the old podcasts and take out all the uh, the advertising that's in them because at the time, you know, it was uh, I was making money with it, and so it had advertisers and it had. Uh, commercials in it and everything. So I'm trying to slowly take those and strip out all the ads and take out any of the time sensitive information like giving, uh, you know, come, come to pork fest. It's going to be this date and this time and it's cost this much. So I'm trying to take out that kind of discussion that's in it. And it's typically right. cuts them down to about 45 minutes, which is pretty good. Um, but I've only got a very small handful of those done. So eventually, hopefully, I'll get some of that and get it up on the Bad Quaker site for people to get to. Okay. Very good. Very good. And I think I can manually insert that into Apple Podcasts, but I just haven't had a chance to. I've recorded. This is my fourth interview in this this week, Monday through Thursday. So I haven't had time to do uh, do anything. Um, yeah, these past four days, but, um, but yeah, I need to, I need to just dig through, you know, start at the beginning and just listen all the way through because it, for, for some reason, there are times when, uh, you know, there are a lot of great podcasts out there, but, uh, like I, it's kind of like I, I created the podcast that I wanted to hear and there aren't really any podcasts out there that are like that. So, um, I need to, and, and I think yours is probably, probably a lot, and what I've heard is it's got a lot like that. So, um, I, I always think about that and it's like, oh, Apple podcast, damn, I'm driving. Like I can't do all of that while I'm driving. Damn. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get on that. I'll definitely get on that. But, uh, but thank you, Ben, for, for all your work and, uh, for coming on here and, and, and chatting with us. It was, uh, certainly, I don't think there are a lot of folks that would have uh, come on and had this conversation. So I, I certainly appreciate, uh. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. And uh, Jason, uh, you know, thanks for this is your first time on Liberty Under Attack, so I appreciate you, you coming in, uh, you know, guest co-hosting. And uh, yeah, for, uh, for for the listeners, you can catch Jason. Uh, we record about every week uh, for for the Vonnie Podcast, so uh, go check that out, VonniePodcast uh, dot com. So uh, um, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Hey, I'm just stoked to be here. <laughs> All right, so um, thanks you guys, thanks so much guys for for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was, uh, uh, I think it was certainly kind of a, an original podcast. I think you're, you're, I don't think you're going to hear a lot of these uh, these sort of discussions. But uh, but again, as I've, as I've said, you know, if you'd like to shoot us a holiday donation, uh, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, we have a Patreon page, and we accept PayPal cryptocurrencies, and you can also shop through our affiliate affiliate links. Uh, Veerwalks, the virtual world exchange, 
if you would actually like to use cryptocurrencies for their original purposes without sending a DNA sample uh, to Coinbase. Uh, that's not that's a little uh, you know a little hyperbole, but but not really. Uh, they do do uh, facial biometrics now with uh, with with cameras. So if you want uh, you know privacy with the cryptocurrencies, Virtual World Exchange is a great place. Um, if you start out, you can only buy a hundred dollars worth. Of, you can only okay. So let me get back on this real quick. So Virtual World Exchange, the first time I tried to buy Bitcoin was to buy silver. Uh, that was kind of the the only purpose. And uh, I found this website, and it's actually a like a, a gaming you know digital currency exchange. So like Second Life, Linden Dollars, and the Sims currency. Um, that's the purpose. Um, but you can also buy Bitcoin uh, on there, uh, you know, through uh, through PayPal, um, and it takes about uh, 30 seconds to actually get Bitcoin. So it, it works very very well. And uh, you know the fees. Uh, I, I compare the fees to Coinbase, and uh, it's like two percent cheaper. So. Uh, so it, there is that. Uh, you can find the affiliate link there. And uh, also, uh, if you want to shop on Amazon, uh, that is there uh, on the sidebar. So thanks so much, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, keep a lookout for the conclusionary episode for this mini series. There's uh, certainly a lot uh, to talk about. I'll talk to you later.